Zachariah, how are you, man? Very well, my friend. How are you? Doing great, man. I appreciate you coming and visiting with us, and welcome to Ohio. You know, I know you had a little bit of a travel and transit today, but why don't you uh, start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up up to over the last couple of years? Man, last couple of years, you know, that even that has a lot of categories. Yeah, I know you it, said you were in Puerto Rico for a little while. I was. So I'll tell you yeah. what I'm doing right now. So yeah. right now, there's two primary things that I'm up to. One is I am the CMO of the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. Okay. We are a 46 year old holistic cancer education nonprofit organization. But because all of that's a mouthful, yeah. we keep it very simple and say we are Beat Cancer. So we do business as beatcancer.org and we help people heal or prevent cancer using holistic remedies and modalities because obviously there's too much suffering and ailment out there in all sorts of shapes and forms, cancer included being one of the most prevalent ones, but it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. So I run that organization with a partner and I'm the CMO is the official title, but we're both kind of the everything guys. Yeah. You know, we have some assistance, but you know, we're also answering the emails, doing the admin, revamping the website, doing the marketing and then all the everything. So, uh, yeah, I'm doing that right now. And then I also run a podcast of my own called The Health King's Court, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Health. Oh, okay. And in that, I cover a variety of holistic health and wellness topics, be it physical health, mental health, emotional, spiritual, sexual, familial, societal at large, or uh, other sorts of esoteric ancient wisdom topics. Yeah. Uh, I love it, man. Tell me a little bit about that organization. You said 46-year uh, old organization. I know you talked about once before uh, the founder and her kind of experience going through this cancer thing with her family. Yeah, so it the origin story is one of very relatable tragedy, mm -hmm. unfortunately. You know, uh, our founder approximately 50 years ago, a woman named Susan, she was an academic and a loving wife, and her husband ended up getting cancer. And not knowing any better or not knowing any alternatives, her husband went to the conventional treatment centers, be it hospitals, and got conventional treatment, hmm. radiation, chemo, et cetera, what have you. And Susan got to watch what this did to people. She got to watch his quality of life, his will to live, his physicality, his mentality, his emotionality all go down the toilet very sharply. Hmm. Thought to herself there had to be a better way. Back then, there was no www.anything. Mm. There was no internet. It was before the internet. Mm -hmm. So she did what she could to learn other ways of dealing with this. Going to libraries, calling up doctors, calling up researchers, calling up holistic healing practitioners, whatever she could to study the body and study health and study cancer from a holistic lens. The more she learned, the more she realized, wow, this is powerful. And mm. she just dedicated her entire life to figuring this out for her husband. Now, unfortunately, your husband didn't himself get very on board and the outlook was grim and he actually ended up dying exactly when the doctor said he was going to die, mm. which was shortly after. And that brings up a very interesting question, right? Are doctors magical? Do they have these crystal balls where they can predict the future? Definitely. Or does it play a part when they tell someone these things and give their prognosis and give their timelines and that person ends up repeating it to themselves over and over again, does their body follow suit? Mm -hmm. We know our mind is very powerful and it could be our best friend or our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Well, now that this uh, occurred, Susan was of course devastated, you know, any loving spouse would be, especially when you knew it didn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. And so with that devastation, she took that energy and she formed her life's mission for the rest of her working years. She formed the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. It's always been a nonprofit, just with the goal of educating people on holistic ways of dealing with cancer. Mm. And she just did everything that she could to start educating others, kind of the same ways she learned. Wrote books, wrote articles, did radio shows, did live speaking events, worked with patients directly, worked with doctors to train them holistically, worked with people to train them to then go educate people, anything she could. And that's kind of the legacy that we carry today in a modern way. So <clears throat> I'm sure people are listening and a couple people out there are going to go holistic cancer treatment prevention. Their eyes glaze over and they're like, oh, like they're convincing me I need crystals and, you know, healing massages where a <laughs> practitioner pushes energy into you and cures you of cancer. So two questions, maybe describe to me what it is and what it's not. And then what would you say to people who go like, well, this is uh 
you know, bullshit. This is bullshit. Like, yeah. dude, you need to go see a doctor. My yeah. mind instantly goes to Steve Jobs. You know, that's like kind of the yeah. famous story about something similar to these. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah. Well, the, the first caveat I'll have to give is that we never use the C word cure. That word okay. is very uh, held strongly by the medical establishment. And so we don't try to impede upon their favorite words that's by a good point. using that's them. That's a good point. So we help people heal. We educate people. We give people interesting information. That's mm. all. What I'd say to the people that say, ah, that's nonsense, I don't like it, I don't want it, I'd say, okay, good. You have every right to do what you'd like to do. See, me personally, I'm not someone that wants to convince the world or change the systems or you know, have everyone do these things. I don't care mm. to do that, right? I'm for a free market. If people wanna go get themselves hacked open and radiated, that's their prerogative, right? Mm. So to someone who's entirely closed-minded, I am not going to fight you to convince you to seek this information. What use of energy would that be for me? Uh, so if, if that answers that question, but with someone that's kind of on the fence and, and you to answer the segment of the question where it's like, what is it and what is it not? Well, we got to strip back the conversation to a fundamental analysis of cancer and what the body actually even is. Okay. Because cancer isn't some boogeyman that comes down from the sky and infects people. Cancer isn't some genetic destiny that someone's destined to get via their genes when they're born, right? Cancer is an effect of causes. Okay. Cancer is our own cells that are unhealthy. And that's a natural thing. We naturally, you and I sitting here right now, have cells that are unhealthy because our body goes through cycles of having cells and those cells get sick, they die, or they just, you know, go, they just become unwell and they get purged and new cells replace them. That's a cycle of life. And there's certain things that can put cells in an unhealthy condition. And there's certain things that can put cells in a healthy condition. Mm. And there's certain things that can keep the body systems of purging those unhealthy cells well. And there's certain things that could block those pathways and block those avenues and allow those unhealthy cells to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate to the point where it's recognized as cancer. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to one of our cancer coaches on one of my podcast episodes, and she gave an interesting reframe that we all have cancer every day. I saw that. I saw the title of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty cool one, right? And it's a pretty interesting thing because, wow, that might sound scary, but it's also empowering. And it's also kind of framing it where it's not that big a deal. Mm. And I say that, of course, with respect to those suffering from cancer, it's a, it's a very treacherous thing to be going through. But when we have that comprehension that cancer is just our own cells that are unhealthy, so what can we do to make sure our cells are the healthiest possible and mm. get those unhealthy cells out of us, then... That's kind of what sets the framework for the things that we talk about. Mm. We don't claim to have any sort of fountain of youth, magical crystal ball, crystal anything, whatever. Not that I'm anti-crystal. In fact, mm. crystal technology is all around us. Look at that liquid crystal display yeah, we got right, right up there. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're just talking about fundamentals, man. Eat good. Clean your house with good stuff that's not going to be poisoning you. Mm. Be mindful of what clothing you're wearing. You know, and so all these physical poisons that are ever present in this modern world, we kind of educate people on how to avoid them and what safer and more natural alternatives are out there and ever increasingly out there, which is wonderful. But then there's also the other side of things. Our founder always said, it's not just what you're eating, but what's eating you. Mm. And that brings in the emotional side of things. I saw that that seemed to be a big part of it, kind of your mental and emotional state and yeah. how that proliferates in your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is something that's been known for civilizations and cultures all around the world for centuries and whatever, because our physicality and our mentality and our emotionality and our spirituality are inherently tied in this human experience. Mm. There's no separation or segregation of these things. And now what does that mean? Well, certain organs have certain emotional correlates and certain emotional pathways that are tied to those physical organs. And this has actually been scientifically observed where certain personality traits or certain traumas or certain habits, mental and emotional habits, have scientifically significant correlation with certain types of cancer. Hmm. Can you give me like an example there? Yeah. And they're not that hard to comprehend when we start to kind of break them down. So let's talk about colon cancer. Okay. That's a big one. It's a big one. It I think it's on the rise too, correct? They're all on the rise. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately yeah. yeah. And 
So the people that often get colon cancer or people that often get colon cancer are people that have trouble letting go of the past. Interesting. People that have a strong victim mentality, people that have a strong resentment or inner rage and just can't let go Mm. of something that happened to them or that they experienced or their life circumstances. They just can't let it go. Those people often end up getting colon cancer. Now, what is the colon on the physical side? The colon is the organ responsible for eliminating waste. Mm. And when people seem to have trouble eliminating emotional waste, there seems to be scientifically significant correlations Mm. with those people getting colon cancer. But then it doesn't stop there. We want to talk about breast cancer. Breast cancer has a lot of physical causes, a lot of physical causes. We could talk about underwire bras. We could talk about toxic deodorants, et cetera. Mm. There's a constant barrage on you know, women's hormones. Hormonal birth control. I know that's a big yeah. one that people are talking about a lot more now. Yep, yep. That's a controversial one. I know you have some controversial <sighs> opinions, uh, but a lot of people get sensitive because they're like, you can't take away birth control. It's like, well, we're not saying that, but let's also be realistic that this isn't 100% positive, you know? Just nothing's 100% positive, It's insane, positive, man. Right? It's insane that people have come to this state of, of servitude to the, and worship of pharmaceutical companies where they think it's ever a good idea to be on synthetic hormones every single day for the rest of their life. Like, are you insane? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'll keep it as calm as you want to, but this gets me fired up because we're putting people on synthetic hormones every day well young younger people too um you know i know that it's not uncommon now for 14 year old girls 15 year old girls and look this isn't my area like i'm not the person to comment on this but i know that is i don't have any daughters i have no dog in this fight that's a scam but i know that young people are being put on these hormones and i just kind of think like well this person hasn't fully developed yet like so it's i know there's a lot of hormonal changes that happen to you when you're 12, 14, 16, 18, yeah. you know, for boys, even 21, 22, 23, just like I wouldn't tell my 14 year old son, be like, let's start taking testosterone. <laughs> I'd be like, let, let's let you grow up first. Mm-hmm. Like, let's let you fully, uh, you know, mature. And then at that point in time, like maybe we'll think about, you know, medical interventions that are a little more serious, but even then it's, it's going to change your fundamental underlying function of your hormonal system. Yeah. And Most likely permanently. And, and even that, testosterone, I think, would even be a bit of a different case because then you're trying to give the young boy more of what his male body should have mm-hmm. versus birth control is fighting against the natural processes sure. of the body. Yeah. So it, it valid you know, comparison, of course, but like even that would be a little better mm-hmm. you know, than fighting against the natural, um, the natural cycles. Well, hey, it worked for Lionel Messi, man. You know, he had like growth hormones when he was like, like 10, 11 years old, because they thought he was going to legitimately be tiny. Like yeah. they thought he would not make it over five feet tall and he took growth, growth hormones. And now he's the you know, best athlete in the world in that specific sport. So, you yeah. know, it, there's fringe cases where it does work out, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm, sure I'm not familiar with him. his case, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you can look it up, Steve. That's, I think it's pretty well documented. And but yeah, that's a little off to, uh, topic, to, but. to finish the, the example that I was giving women with uh, trouble with their children, I was going to say trouble with their children, whether Mm. it's death of a child or in a strange relationship with a child or some giant fight and fallout or issue where they're worried about their child financially or they're worried about supporting their children. These kinds of emotional issues are what have been found very prevalent in women with breast cancer. And I think it's important probably to say right now that the body is very complex. There's 50,000 different factors that are going into this. Because someone out there is going to go, well, my aunt had breast yeah, cancer yeah. and she was, you know, she was as happy as could be. <laughs> and like, she didn't have any grudges that she was holding. Yeah. It's like, okay, guys, look, look, this is not, this isn't every single case fits into this box. Yeah. These are generalities. There's a reason why generalities exist. Like in general, men tend to be stronger than women, but yeah, there's some women <laughs> who are definitely stronger than you and I. Yes. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, yes, that's a fringe case or that's an exception, but we're talking about the, the thing that happens quite often we got the the messy yeah. pattern um, recognition yeah self-administered injections from a young age uh <laughs> brett this is saying that bred self-reliance i'm guessing that it bred like thick ligaments is what it bred i mean he's not that big but uh what did that uh just go back steve to the google i just wanted to see what they kind of highlighted there um yeah 
gland releases significantly less growth hormones than in usual circumstances. He had a childhood disease um, that affects between 1 in 10,000 to 3,000 children. So he was missing or had a smaller pituitary gland. So it's basically the op opposite of uh, gigantism where your pituitary gland is just like super hy hyperactive and you just grow to seven, eight, nine, ten 10 feet tall. Um, yeah, but, you know, the medical establishment has really kind of infected people's minds. So sorry to try to kind of go off topic there, but you were talking about the connection between your brain and your mental approach and cancer. And if people are going, well, that sounds like bogus. Um, the first thing that I would say is, well, what about the placebo effect? Like yeah. your body can legitimately tell itself that, hey, we're, we're taking this thing that's going to fix us, you know, feel better essentially. And you just mentally connect to your body to feel better. Yeah. And it's not a small effect. They know that this effect happens every single study. They know that the placebo effect will will have maybe 20 percent or a 30 percent effect on those people who are in the control group. So it's like, well, what is that? Where yeah. does that come from? Like I said at the very beginning, our mind could be our best friend or our worst enemy. And, you know, there is the power of just going within and, and healing yourself from within. And there is also the power of several God-given tools that we have all around us in nature. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is um, also, there's a doctor, and Steve, check this one out. He's like a back um, doctor. And part of his area of research is that people have like convinced themselves they have back pain and it's like they're holding on to this <laughs> just search like back pain doctor um you know it's in your brain or it's in your head or something like that he's really famous um and well, and he has like tens of thousands john sarno yeah that's him uh, he name. has tens of thousands of people where they go and listen to like one of his lectures and I have no idea kind of how he, he works this. And I'm sure that this article in Vox is probably just going to show Yeah, he looks apart. evil right there. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> definitely like making him look eagle, yeah. evil. He argued that pain was actually the result of a psychosomatic process and emotional factors. Uh, which, and look, which he's not wrong. Which she's not wrong. Look, some people do have like herniated discs. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's separate that some people do have medical issues that that are physical are physical and hard to explain with any you know kind of going you know i don't want to know what you want to call it into the mental realm <laughs> but he has lots of people if you like go look at his book review like on amazon i bet you he has ten thousand positive yeah. reviews and people are just like this changed my life so what yeah. is that you know so, yeah well, explain that oh exactly and, and they won't they'll just you know brush that under the rug but right. yeah so like you said there's people that have done physical damage to their spine to their back and there's people that have muscular imbalances etc but like i said before our physicality and our emotionality are inherently tied and there is a back and forth that can occur when we get physical damage to certain areas of the body back included because there's no separating any part of our body from emotional issues when we get those physical issues, it can then stem into um, emotional issues, and then it can go kind of ping-pong back and forth. Yeah, we got this Sarno book. He has uh, a book called Healing Back Pain. It has 7,300 ratings. It's 4.4 stars. Just click it. Let's read like one or two testimonials. Uh, yeah, if you just click that uh, 73 right there. Yep, click that, Steve. Yeah, 25 years, chronic pain, anxiety, fusion, personal experience, I believe than this 100%. I read this book multiple times as well as listened to the audio version. I truly believe his theory is spot on. I wanted to share my story because I believe it aligns with everything he describes. 43-year-old male with long history of continuous health issues for the better part of the past 25 years. Yeah. So, again, it's, it's Look, I've the lived medical it. establishment, they just want to go, no, no, like, there's no science to support that. And sometimes, this is a, something that, you know, talking back to, about Amazon, but, Jeff Bezos would say when the data and the anecdotes uh, don't line up with each other, listen to the anecdotes. <laughs> and he yeah, had this yeah. issue where um, the customer service team was telling him that they get to a customer in like 45 to seconds to one minute. And he was like, mm, that doesn't sound right because I'm hearing all these stories of it taking 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes for a customer service representative to answer. 
and he's sitting in the meeting with these people and he goes, well, let's just call customer service right now. And they're like, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, well, you're telling me 45 seconds to one minute is the average. So like that we should be somewhere in that realm. And he calls in and they sat on the phone for like 15 minutes before yeah. they hung up. That, and and that's like, the whole thing. Let's listen to the anecdote for a second. That's the thing. People have been led blindly to worship data unquestioningly, unquestioningly of who compiled it and how they compiled it and who funded them compiling it and what they are allowed to say and completely ignore their own eyes. You know, it's... Uh, mm, well, when it comes to data, um, I believe John Abrahamson is the individual who's like the, the leader in this. It's either Abrahams or Abrahamson. And he was a lawyer that um, was utilized often to fight against the pharmaceutical companies. Um, I think it's yeah, Abraham or Abrahamson. Yeah, there he is, Abrahamson. He was uh, specifically utilized by the pharmaceutical, or excuse me, in fighting the pharmaceutical companies. And one of the things that I picked up from him was these pharmaceutical companies do not release their raw data when they come out with a product. Mm -hmm. They release their synopsis of the data. So yeah. I don't want to go to COVID vaccines, but let's just say, like, uh, you know, you create a product. What you are going to, and you do a study with 10,000 people, right? And you may have some outlier data, like this is what has happened with some of these products and it's now come to light where let's say you have two people who die in your study and they're permitted to go, well, that's mm -hmm. outlier or like, well, they didn't die because of our product. They already had cancer, so they just died, right? And they can just go, well, we're going to nix that out of the study. Mm -hmm. And if they did that, it was like, hey, look, like, you know, one in every 5,000 people who take your product die. Like, where is that relevant? They can just go, that's not relevant to our study. And then they'll give you their kind of prepared data. Mm -hmm. And all you get to see is their data that says 80% um, of people who take this see a 40% reduction in cancer. And you're like, well, geez, like 80%, 40% reduction. Like, this is amazing. Like, for sure, we should take this, you know, product. But in fact, you're not seeing the whole picture. You're seeing their prepared set of data. So when they go to the peer review process, they get to take whatever data that they want to present to you, and then they get to show you it. Yeah. Right? So that's like saying, I'm the best basketball player in the world. We'll prove that. It's like, well, uh, I shot, you know, some certain amount of baskets, and I get to provide to you the data that I want. And it's like, well, I make 70% of my layups. Wow, he's really good. You know, but it's like, well, I miss. 90% of my threes. So it's crazy that you just get to take this data and present it in whatever light that you so choose. And we don't get to actually see the raw data. And that's been going on for a really long time. Yeah. I mean, and what do you expect? Right. What do you expect when you're, how aggressive? What do you expect when you're selling products that are dangerous or perhaps fundamentally flawed in their place? In the I body? unfortunately expect more um, because. For me, when you start to talk about people's health, I do think there is a higher burden of responsibility to what um, level of service, level of focus, level of concentration that you will give them. Um, but then where's their personal responsibility? See, well, certainly, it's yes. super easy to look at these pharmaceutical companies and say they're evil. That's an easy case to make. But... Where's the personal responsibility? I think it's tough because people have been, I don't want to say brainwashed. That's not really fair. But, but also accurate. <laughs> we, we've been conditioned, certainly. Yeah. I've told this story on here before, but I'll tell it again. Like I was sitting with a friend and we were watching, this would have been three years ago at the Olympics. And I don't watch a lot of TV, like network TV, but I was watching these network TV broadcasts of the Olympics and like three out of every four ads was a pharmaceutical ad. Oh my God. It's and I was like, nauseating. this is crazy. And I turned to my friend and I was like, do you think that they actually want you to take this product? Do you think they really want me to ask my doctor about Humira? Or do you think that they're trying to convince you that when you have an issue or an ailment, you need to go talk to your doctor and get a prescription? And they were like, well, that's a good point. And, and I personally think they're kind of just trying to wear you down. Like, you health is not your thing that you can control we are the gatekeepers to health when you are unhealthy you come and see us and we give you something that makes you healthy and 
I think that, you know, it's it's a tank running over a foot soldier. They have enormous resources to convince you that that is the way that you go about health. So I think that like what you're doing, as you stated previously, hey, if you don't want to listen to me, you don't have to. That's mm-hmm. cool. That's your responsibility. You're right. You have freedom. But I do think it is difficult for people to rebel, if you will, because the system is, is very powerful. Yes, but yeah, and trust me, I understand all yeah. of these things, and, and I've been on my own personal journey it, of, of, of about thinking about all these things and, and positioning in the world. And, and the one that I'm at now is, it really is one of personal sovereignty and accountability and full responsibility, because yes, the systems of the world are set up the way they are. Yes, they're not in the favor of the everyday person. Yes, they make it very difficult for someone to do anything, mm-hmm. to win in anything, in finances, and health, and in education, and anything. But who said it's supposed to be easy? Is it not the way of the world that's the way it's always been and the way it always will be, that powerful entities will enforce their power and use their power to keep their power? Certainly, that's not new. Can you expect anything different? Is it morally righteous? Probably not. Perhaps in their heads, it's justifiable in some sort of way. Perhaps they think they're doing everyone a good favor. Yeah, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. Um, but, you know, regardless of what they are doing, I'll always turn it back to what can we do? Hmm. You know? And, I mean, we got damn near close to being held down and, and had things put into our bloodstream the last couple of years, and I'm sure several people perhaps were. But... You know, short of that, we do still have some sort of freedom Mm -hmm. to not consume things and not trust certain professionals or so-called prescribed experts. And, uh, you know, certain people will never break out of that slave mind and certain people will. And it just is what it is. So let's talk about uh, cancer and then, you know, how you start to counsel and and Mm -hmm. help people through this process and Unfortunately, if you have cancer, you know, you're there, right? Like you, there's no going back to the beginning. We can definitely talk and we probably should talk about like some prevention type things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, how does it go? An uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> so talk to me maybe about how you think about when someone has more cancer, right? Because as stated, we all have a little cancer. Um, how people go about beginning that process of healing more holistically well first we got to configure out root cause okay if you don't figure out the why you can never figure out the how yeah right i heard you say that people can go in and cut their cancer out but that's not a fix it's a it's a potentially and sometimes that works but that might be temporary until you relapse recurrence statistics in conventional avenues are appalling Mm. and understandably so and then when we comprehend that the body is designed as a closed loop system we understand that cutting into it can have other harm as well, and, and often does, mm-hmm. you know, at, at all different levels. And then we could get into medical mistakes, which, mm-hmm. you know, as good as surgeons can be, and some are wonderful at their profession, mistakes can happen. Um, so what do we do when someone has cancer? Are you talking about like our procedures or yeah. what can someone do period let's uh e- either or you know let's say that you know tomorrow i'm diagnosed with some cancer um where would that process begin what are the, the kind of key tenets that i need to begin to think about what's important what's less important what's hey this might help you know blueberry enemas but that's not really what we're gonna do <laughs> i've heard that I've blueberries heard, hmm, yeah. i haven't heard of the blueberries yeah, Co- like, coffee come, is a come common on, one steve get, uh, google that one i mean me. i don't doubt it i'm sure people are putting all sorts of yeah, <laughs> but no, there was apparently like uh, blueberries yeah. are great, and just search on the, a, in the search, other end. Search so. cancer. Yeah, enema cancer. Yeah, blueberries are great on the other side. So why not? Why not there too? Yeah, blueberry hus. See if you can find anything for me, Steve. But uh, maybe yes. I'm making this up, but I I nah, know I'm, for I'm a sure fact it's... that I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> But they were like, there might not, you might not be able to get enough. I was Bro, like, I right, feel no. like your uh, excrement would be blue for the next month. Almost you know? <laughs> definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway. So, yeah, so where do we begin here? You know, it, it's, I, I wish I had an exciting answer, but it's a boring answer. It's exactly what I said earlier. It's figuring out what's 
eating you and and what you're eating and how you could improve that, right? You'd want to mm. take an audit of everything, every input that your body's receiving on the physical side of things. Again, food, water, air, clothing, body products, cleaning products, both of yourself and of the household. You know, what are you exposing yourself to? What are you inputting? Then you'd probably want to stop inputting anything that is clearly damaging. What are the kind of first ones that you see people go, oh, that, that, could, that could be an issue? I mean, everything's so independent. But you mean like things that surprise people that like people don't often think about? Y- yeah. I mean, I'm sure people just take a lot of things for granted. Um, yeah. I mean, you got to cut out the processed foods, the mm. uh, chemical garbage that has no place in the body. You know, sugar's a big one. Sugar directly feeds cancer. So you want to, you know, chill out with that. It doesn't look like Steve can find anything, everyone. So uh, I'm providing <laughs> medical misinformation. Do not do a blueberry <laughs> enema unless you really feel like it. You know, do your yeah. own homework on this. Um, mm, uh, John Kellogg, the founder of Kellogg Cereal, one of his big things was yogurt enemas, daily yogurt enemas for his patients. Interesting. Well, I mean, don't know. Again, yogurt can be great on the other I, side. I, I so. just, I just saw like <laughs> the, people talking about that there. So people are still talking about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the things that people are maybe overlooking in their day-to-day lives. Processed foods. Yeah, I mean, water. Mm. Water is a big one. Our bodies are what percent water? So why would we not be putting high-quality water in our bodies to replenish the water in our bodies, right? And mm. so what does high-quality water look like? Well, there's discrepancy there. Some people say distilled. Some people say reverse osmosis. Mm. Some people say with minerals. Some people say without. Personally, my preference is uh, reverse osmosis then with minerals added back in. Mm. But, you know, if anyone's getting an actual quality filter and doing any of the above, they're probably worlds beyond app or, yeah. you know, bridge filters or Brita that don't do anything. Yeah, and two, two things there that I'll just comment on. Uh, the first one being um, water that's been stored in plastic for long periods of time. Mm. I'm a big uh, advocate of people trying their best. And people always contend with me on this because they're like, well, well, yeah. it, you know, it touched a plastic filter when it was coming out of the tap. And I'm like, look, you, yes, you're right. I cannot be perfect, but it's a lot better than me making absolutely no effort. Yeah, those doing nothing will always try to tear down those trying to do something. Yeah, most definitely. So um, one of the big ones is um, heating things. So do not heat your water and anything plastic. Like if you're making a tea, do not use a plastic mug that you're going to put into uh, the microwave. Do not cook your well, food in anything. We can talk about pl- microwaves and plastic. Themselves. Oh no, man! Am I, you're going to take my microwave away. <laughs> um, don't heat your food in anything plastic. Like, don't just take your like TV dinner and throw it into the microwave, um, because the thinner that plastic is, the easier it is to break that wall down and get into uh, your liquids. So. Liquids, obviously, slightly more permeable than a food, but foods, if you're going to heat in a microwave, you're just taking that plastic and you're just literally cooking it, weakening the cell wall so that it'll just break into your food. Um, those are things that I just tell people, I'm like, dude, this is so simple. Just take a, take a glass, take it, flip it out, put it into the glass, put it in your microwave. You're going to save yourself a lot of hassle. There's an author, Shana, Shana Swan, wrote a book, Countdown, and... She's done tons of research on this, that these microplastics will accumulate in your body and there's just no good way for you to get them out of your body. And it has uh, three gener- two generations. So like you have a child, that child has a child. They're still going to be passing those microplastics along. And it has all sorts of fertility related question marks. For guys, it uh, lowers sperm count. It uh, is potentially a contributing factor amongst others to the decrease in testosterone amongst males. It's like 1% per year for the last like 60 years or something like that. If nothing changes, we'll be completely infertile by 2050. So that's a big one for me. Sorry to kind of steal your thunder there. No, no, you're good because you're saying all sorts of valid things. You know, it's, it's super important. Plastic really has no place in the human body, and yet it finds its way into the human body in a variety of ways. You know, what's uh, the stat that, they, that like we consume like a credit card worth of plastic? It's like every month yeah. or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's a big one for me is just kind of getting the plastics out of your life. Yeah. And the biggest one that people don't realize with that is clothing. 
Most mm-hmm. people are walking around in plastic clothing, literally yeah. plastic clothing. That's a tough one. Because polyester, you know, nylon, spandex, yeah. rayon, all these plastic, plastic, plastic. Five grams of pl- microplastic every week, which is about the size of a credit card. I feel like I caught, I gotta call bullshit on that because five grams of plastic is like a lot. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, but Maybe now you, then you have to think of the average human's behavior. That's true. I mean, if you are at least water. semi-conscious of these things, you're going to be less yeah. than average. But the average person is doing a lot of unhealthy things. I, I just can't even, I mean, five grams a week. So, you know, by the end of the year, like how much plastic is that in your body? And you do that year in, year in, year out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's crazy. Um, yeah, the clothing one is a tough one because a lot of clothing. And like nice materials, you're like, oh, this is nice. It's really mm-hmm. nice, convenient to wear. It's Convenience comes one. at a cost. Yeah. It always does. There's no avoiding I would think that the, correct me if I'm wrong, but would you say that the most important place for your clothing to be optimized would be your underwear? Or do you not think about it like that? Um, is it certainly one of our most sensitive areas for men and women? Very the Hormone po- very, production. Exactly. Yeah. Hormone production. There's a lot of heat there because mm. heat directly interacts with, yeah, that makes you know, and, and activates the plastic chemicals, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean- if someone was to change one garment, should it be their underwear? Probably. Maybe, but you know? go, go full bore. Get it all. Yeah, on, right? yeah. Um, but we were talking about water a second ago, and people like to talk about drinking clean water. That's only a part of the equation. The showering, yeah. There you go, the showering. Mm. Exactly. And that's honestly one of my favorite actionables to lead people on with because it's so easy. It's so cheap. And the effects are so noticeable. Do you do like one of the filters at the yeah. um, at the, the shower head? Amazon special, search it up, bam, bam, pick whatever, which one everyone looks prettiest and has the nice coupon code. You know, I don't I know there's one buzzy brand. I can't recall the name of them right now, but they're they're like venture capital backed and they're really like crushing it. Um, I've done the route of just purchasing whichever one pops up. They've all been exactly the same. They mm-hmm. come with the same cartridge and the same filter in it. Is there some variance? Sure, but you know, I just grab whichever is low cost and yeah, toss it on there. Those, yeah, Aqua Bliss. I have one. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, they're they're so easily noticeable. The effect. Really? So I I put it on my family's household years ago when I first found out about them, and everyone's like, "Oh, what are you doing? Shower filter, better for you." Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Didn't you know? Ask about it more. Within a week, everyone, wow, my nails are feeling good. My skin feels so good. My hair is so soft. So Dang. people that weren't on board, they couldn't even placebo themselves. They didn't even know what I was doing. Mm. They're like, whoa. So. Dang. Well, shoot, I don't have one, so I'm going to have to get on yeah. that. Because yeah. I'm, I'm on it too, you know. And that's the crazy thing where you can be on it, and then there's just like so many additional things. It does get fatigued. There's levels. There's levels, man. Yeah. But then people are like, this dude is like, a kooky dude like he's yeah. not wearing shoes you know that's all right <laughs> like, man oh, if i gosh. if i appear crazy to a crazy world i'm all right yeah that, that's a know? good point good point. but uh, you bring up a good point though right it, it, it can be very overwhelming when someone's on a journey of hell trying to make better choices for themselves to be presented with all of these things and all of these fronts to attack on and defend on do what you can yeah make one today yeah figure that out do you have like Make a one later. pyramid, a hierarchy of things that you're like, <laughs> hey, dude, if your budget is, you know, a hundred bucks, tackle these things. If it's a thousand bucks, tackle these things. If it's 10,000. Uh, I've never thought about it so logistically, but the first thing you could do is stop eating artificial things. That's okay. pretty easy. And that yep. doesn't necessarily have to be more expensive. Do I get now, artificial sweeteners or no? You can do whatever you want, my friend. Should <laughs> I consume artificial sweeteners? I'm not here to tell you what you should do. I'll tell you I won't. Okay. Um, all right. Food. Out of the out of the mix, you know that. So that's a super easy one because then that could be as simple as even if you don't clean up, like even if most people at least eat some things that are good and yeah. some things that are bad, whatever. Hopefully, but if you just eat real foods, even if they're not the cleanest versions of those real foods, you're gonna be better off than if you're eating you mm-hmm. know, candy and cookies and and chips and stuff. Eat, Come on, everyone eat. everyone knows that. You know, yeah. it's not that complicated. And then the next thing would be body products. Yep. Okay. Because then again, that's direct physical input. Deodorant is a big one because, again, just like the genitals, it's a very porous and heat triggering area. So, what do you do for that one? Because I've, I've. Can I shout out a brand? Or Absolutely, is, is man. Dude, so ancient healings. Ancient healings. Plural. Ancient healings. Ancient dash healings. 
Because because I'm looking for a solution to this, dude. Because you... in the winter, it's not really a big deal. I can just go without deodorant. Yeah. But during the summer, I'm like, dude, I'm sweating. Yeah, so and, I've been on a natural health journey for several years. I have tried so many natural deodorants. Okay. A lot of them don't work, Anxious. especially oh, a lot yeah. of the plant-based ones. So this one, and this is run by two gentlemen, small company, super cool. It's tallow-based. Okay. Tallow, if you don't know, is animal oh, fat. Oh, it's, they're it's calling beef that fat. sunscreen. Dude. It's uh, good. It's, it's funny though because we stuff. had a, we had um, a gentleman on. He runs a company that's a little bit similar. Um, it's called Earthly Wellness. They're great. Uh -huh. They make, gosh, probably 150 like natural products, all really legit. Like I would totally endorse anything that they sell. But we went down the rabbit hole with sunscreen. Yeah. And he's like, I'm not allowed to call my product a sunscreen. He's like, fundamentally, I don't know. I, what, yeah. I'm not allowed to say that my products do anything for yeah, you yeah. because I don't have pharmaceutical level ingredients in yep. them i cannot make the case that it whatever re relieves anxiety or something along <laughs> those lines yeah uh sunscreen's a whole thing perhaps i'm a bit biased because i've been blessed with you know nice tan skin that only absorbs sun in a blessful way but um you know as far as sun goes i'm team welcome the sun in yeah, right as am i and the whole thing with the sun is the sun will react with chemicals that you have in your body if your body and skin is full of chemicals, right? Yeah. But if your body is free of chemicals, you will be in a much better scenario to tolerate the sun. Then, of course, you have to train your skin. You can't just go from being inside, inside, inside to the Miami sun for four days straight. Your body's not used to it and expect not to get burnt. Then there's all sorts of things we talk about, how when you wear sunglasses, like most people do when they're in the sun, they set their body up for failure because then they're not allowing it to prep for the sun because they're eyes are meant to take in ah it's sunny outside yeah. which allows their body to prepare their skin to receive the sun as well but people are interfering with that natural procedure as well to their own detriment there's oh. levels to this man no i never thought about that now and, and it's interesting you say that because um huberman is all about in the start of the day get sunlight into your eyes and that yeah. was the first time i ever heard he he, he was uh, not an advocate for sun on your skin. Yes, that's good. But he's like, no, this mechanism only occurs when you get sun into your eyes. You convert cortisol, your mm -hmm. stress hormone, into testosterone, your yeah. sort of action hormone. I look at the sun as much as the skies up above allow me to do so. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things in the sky that prevent me from doing so where I live a lot of the time. But mm -hmm. yeah, I straight up look at the sun. Mm. Okay. I, I'm not advising anyone else to do that, especially if you have toxins in your eyes that the sun could possibly react with. I look at the sun mm. as much as I can. Well, it's it's funny because I have a buddy and he he has some some kooky beliefs, and I would admit <laughs> it. Like some things, I'm like, okay, I, I, and I will try to understand where someone is coming from. Um, I am, I think, humble enough that if someone says something to me, and my first reaction is, well, that's bullshit. I'll go, well, wait, why do you think that's bullshit? And if you go, well, I don't really have any evidence to say that that is bullshit. Um, I'll, I'll listen. I'll think mm -hmm. about it. And this was probably like six or seven years ago. He's like, dude, I just do this thing. It's called sun gazing. And yep. I, my, my reaction is yep. probably what everyone listening goes when they hear you say, I look at the sun. They're like, that guy's an idiot. He's going to blind himself, right? Okay. And I was like, you look at the sun. He's like, yeah. So like what I do is... I, I wake up and I try to get up before the sun and then I'll watch the sun rise. Mm -hmm. And then as the sun is setting, I'll watch the sun set. And mm -hmm. then I try not to uh, add really any additional light or like very low li levels of light. Like we have a candle going here. I'll just add low levels of light in. And he's like, I'm training my circadian rhythm. They're mm -hmm. like, when the sun's up, I'm up. When the sun's going down, I go, go down essentially. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that makes sense. Lo and behold, Five years later, Huberman is like, yeah. yeah, when when the sun is rising, get that sunlight into your eyes. There's legit science that it's super beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. People are doing these all these cortisol detoxes and tonics yeah. and things like that. It sounds like the most powerful thing you can do is go get sunlight into your eyes early in the morning. Bro, and I was like, shit, it's that's the it. Giver that's of said. life. It is the end all be all giver of life. It is the son of God. And people yeah. have been led to be afraid of it. It's insane. But before we get too far off topic, if anyone does want to check out Ancient Healings, use code ZAK. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm, I'm going to use it, man, because I'm going to try <laughs> you'll, you'll get some savings on there, and uh, you'll be supporting a small business and uh, helping them. 
So deodorant. Um, oh my god, dude! They have everything. Something a little bit better, a little bit cleaner. And what are the things that when when it because uh, clean to me might mean clean different to you mm. means like someone might be like, oh, Tom's is clean, and you're like, okay, well, I guess it's probably better than you know Gillette. Um, but yeah. what does clean in terms of skin products mean to you? Interesting question. Tom's is an interesting uh, example of a company that started out pretty good and then sold out to one of the conglomerates. Yeah, Tom's, if you look at their ingredients, I'm not, you know, bashing Tom's, but they have like 40 ingredients. Yeah. And there are a lot of ingredients that are pyro, benzoine, you're like ethoates. You're like, what are yeah. these things? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum. So what's clean to me and good to me might not be clean or good to someone else. And and you know, could I be doing better myself on certain ways? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and so there's always you do what you can and there's always a spectrum of clean but a start is if it's just real ingredients mm -hmm. you know if it's just real things versus synthetic things but i guess things that you really want to look out for is blanket terms like fragrance oh yeah fragrance can mean anything mm -hmm. um well also not clearly if they say fragrance it's not a naturally derived fragrance because yeah. that's a selling point right yeah, if it's yeah. like eucalyptus oil they're gonna tell you it's eucalyptus but even the term natural is something to look out for because that could yeah. mean all sorts of nasty things itself in body products or in food or food products rather mm -hmm. um so th those are certain things to look out for there's discrepancy on essential oils some people say essential oils are dangerous some people say they're good of course well, I there's also a spectrum, right? There's like, also a spectrum of concentrations. Yeah. And, and, and where so, you should apply essential oils and what essential oils. Yeah. Um, I think that I saw, it was a study about like lavender, that lavender might be a, a hormone disruptor for some people. <laughs> so it's but like- But see now, okay. who, who disruptor, does it mean it's actually disrupting its dis functional state already and disrupting it back that's, to a healthy that's, that's, state that's, right that's fair maybe you know it maybe it's a regulator and, and that is disrupting the dysfunction so yeah. you know these language tricks are very interesting that certain people with certain biases can use hmm. um but yeah as, as far as looking for clean body products just real ingredients like you said if it's a mm -hmm. nice short list it's probably a little better than something that's like 50 things in there because you don't really need that much in there and I guess a, an important thing to consider when looking at any natural products or then using natural products is, are you setting yourself up to have success with them? In okay. the sake of deodorant, our pits smelling is a function of bacteria and it's a function of detoxification. I was going to ask about this. If you have a whole bunch of crap in your body that your body's having to constantly try to purge out. And you're not letting it because you're jamming your armpits with aluminum <laughs> that like yeah. block it, right? Yeah, it's kind of the exactly. Function of what those are. Oh, 100%. It is an antiperspirant. Yeah. It is anti the body's natural functions, which right. seems to be a trend in, in you know certain industries going anti natural procedures. But mm. Yeah, and so, but I'm saying even when you switch to these natural things, if you might still have stinky pits and then think the product doesn't work, well, maybe your like body is full of stuff that it's trying to give out, and you are abnormally producing. You know, you, you see I've, what I'm saying? I've heard people say, and I felt like this was true for me. I've been on kind of like this this deodorant <laughs> journey, I guess. <laughs> Well, we've just ended it today. Yeah, I promise. I hope so, man. But I felt like when I first stopped wearing deodorant at all altogether, like I did stink for a while and mm -hmm. then it kind of just like regulates fell off and yeah. I didn't really feel like I stunk at all. And then I don't know. <laughs> but maybe, did the people around you think? <laughs> well, I don't think that they, I don't think, again, this is a, either they're very polite or. Uh, <laughs> completely uh they call it ruinous empathy empathy where it's like i refuse to tell you you have something in your teeth because yeah. it's like i'm so empathetic to your feelings i'll say nothing um i don't think that i did stink yeah and then i don't recall honestly like what happened but um i went back to using some different deodorants and now i'm just kind of trying to find something yeah. but do you think that's accurate that some people will kind of smell for a while and then that'll kind of like level off as maybe you excrete some of these toxins or is it if you, it's a, if you it's totally a, it's stink, a, yeah. is that maybe like, oh, there's like some things going on? It could certainly be some things going on, but not necessarily something bad. 
it's no secret that certain people in certain cultures that eat certain abundance of certain spices smell more. Yeah, true. Yeah. So, you know, it, there's always different ways that, the, you know, certain things can manifest. A smell can be a direct result of toxins or it can be just a result of spices and there's nothing actually wrong. Mm. Interesting personal story. I work with a clinical shiatsu specialist. What is that? So shiatsu, please forgive me anyone if I don't do a you know, proper service to describing it, but shiatsu is Asian body work. Okay. You might see you know, shiatsu massage, this, that, whatever. Well, shiatsu is an umbrella term, and there's several different subsections, one of which is clinical shiatsu. So this isn't just you know, mush, mush, feel good massage. This is we're clinically addressing matters okay. of the body. Okay. fixing imbalances, righting wrongs, etc. And just recently, we were working on certain things, and this was through a practice called gua sha, yep, also yep. known as scraping. Yep. I might still have the bruises on my neck, but we scraped here because we were working on freeing up a nerve line that went up this arm and then you know down into the chest, etc. For a visual, if anyone who wants to uh, kind of imagine what he's talking about imagine like taking a butter knife that doesn't have you know the serrated edges and you'll put yeah. oil on it and you'll like just kind of scrape the body mm -hmm. in certain areas oh it's painful it's it's, oh, it's, it's, it's not extremely good. painful yeah and the my, my body reacted indicating that there was toxins in the area okay and through you know bruising etc that only shows up if there is actually things to draw out to the surface because mm -hmm. the whole point of it is to draw out toxins mm -hmm. etc Man, and so it was my neck on my left side. Man, I'd never smelled my pits so nasty. Really? Directly after we did that. Oh. Because it freed up toxins huh. and it was purging out. It, was, it, it wasn't normal BO. Like, you know, I work out, run around, right, sweat, right. work on, you know, work outside, whatever, sweat, have a certain smell to me. This was not that. This was nasty. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I speak from experience on most things I speak on. Otherwise, I'll give a disclosure. Yeah. Okay. So we knocked out some foods. We knocked out some natural products. Uh, we, we knocked out our water. Uh, hopefully, we knocked out some clothing. Are there emotions. other kind of emotions? Emotions are the other side of things, man. Huh? You know, uh, people aren't living right. People aren't living well. People aren't living happy. People are in circumstances that they're just surviving through instead of thriving mm. and it's to a great detriment to themselves you know it's certainly no secret to look around and notice people just being miserable man in themselves and in the world and in their relationships and how could we expect ourselves to be healthy as individuals when all of these other things are unwell it's interesting you say that my first thing in my mind considers is uh whenever they do those interviews with people who are like 103 104 105 and they're all just like obviously they're happy to be alive but they just seem like really happy people <laughs> yeah you know? yeah yeah they're just like i just lived such a great life and i feel so fulfilled i just kind of wonder if you can make it to that age without that level of happiness and i do think that that makes an enormous impact and not only do i think that but they know that um having like a community around you will increase your life. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why religious people end up living longer is because they like go to church and they have a community and they have like a shared foundation and belief. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm a huge proponent of religion, but I, that is a well-established thing that people who are part of communities will live longer. Mm -hmm. People who are in like happy marriages will also live longer. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an interesting thing where, Clearly, there's something there to that, like mental well-being. People who have a mission in life, which I think is super important, mm -hmm. will live longer. Uh, it was just in the Everglades with my family, and the lady who saved the Everglades, Steve, you could look her up, but she lived to be something like 106 years old, and she was like up until like months before she passed away, like campaigning, like we gotta save the Everglades and everything. And she, it was just like her life's work. It was her life mission. Um, and she just had a reason to continue living and a purpose and something that she was fulfilling and going after. And it clearly paid off. Majory Stoneman Douglas. Yeah, there you go. 
American journalist, author, women's suffrage advocate, uh, conservationist known for her staunch defense of the Everglades. She lived to be 108 years old. Woo! Come on, man. She was married for one year to Kenneth Douglas. Well, there goes my uh, happy marriage you know, <laughs> idea. But no, I mean, having a purpose. Like, this is a sad thing when people retire at age 67 and they're like, I'm going to, you know, just live off the rest of my life on the beach drinking margaritas. And they mm -hmm. die like seven years later. Yeah. Because it's like, I don't have a reason to be alive. Yep. No one's counting on me. I don't have anything that I feel like I need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I don't have my sense of family or community or like even just going into the office, the people that I used to spend time around. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of factors, you know, one of it is a body emotion stays in motion. Yeah. Like you said, well, if you don't have a purpose, if what's the point, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't have that will. And then obviously in, in retirement, if someone is then less physically active and then they may be a little more hedonistic in, in certain activities or eating worse or whatever, then it all just kind of compounds. Mm -hmm. this, you know, go to the bar more, this, that, the other. Mm -hmm. um, all, always different factors, but certainly everything you touched on is valid. Mm. So how do you counsel people on their emotional well-being? Because that's like such an ethereal thing. It's like, be happy. Mm -hmm. well, what does that mean? Come on. How do I counsel people? How do we? How do Give we? Give me the gambit, man. Yeah. You know, um, the royal we. The royal we. You know, it's figuring out. All right. So the nuance here is to not ruminate, right. such as is done in traditional mental health facilities. Okay. There's a difference between addressing, figuring things out, and working to heal, and forever ruminating and repeating our problems to ourselves. And this is the dichotomy that I like to break for people, because I hear a lot of people, particularly men, who associate any sort of thinking about trauma or thinking about healing or thinking about kind of what happened to them in childhood with oh, well, now you just want me to, you know, go to therapy and talk about my problems and this and that. And what does that actually do for me? No, I could just forget it and get better. What's really the point? Blah, blah, blah. Because it's that dichotomy of you can push on and just get over it and get to it and get to work and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, do external work. Or you can, you know, sit around and, 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 you know, talk about your problems. There is the respectable and respectful and effective middle ground of figuring things out not harping on them, but then recognizing them and move mm -hmm. forward in a healthier way. Um, so, you know, you, you got to kind of take inventory. How were you raised? What happened to you? What might have consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously stuck with you mm. that has shaped you to being the way that you are now? Because people have this stupid concept that children don't remember things. Mm. perhaps consciously they don't but subconscious doesn't forget right sometimes it represses and that's a whole other thing to unpack but it doesn't forget you know it's not just a blank slate until you're i don't know whatever age people think yeah, eight years memory, old you know i was at yeah. a birthday party at eight yeah you know things go on from the time you're born or even before then that stick with you and then could affect your emotions and affect your thoughts moving forward and if we don't understand why those are occurring, then it's hard to really address them, right? And all you can do is bury them, but do they ever really go away? Or do they continually nag at you and, and until you break? Um, so it's going to be different for everyone's circumstance, right? Perhaps it's something that happened or a combination of things that happened in childhood and into adulthood or even into last week that have shaped you into being the way that you are now. Mm. Yeah, I think you you put a nice bow on it that there's that middle ground. You got to find the middle ground. You don't want to just repress everything and say like, nah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like typical guy thing. Mm -hmm. Like you wait until like your arm's going to fall off before you're like, well, maybe I need to go see the, the shoulder doc, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and we had a trauma expert, trauma specialist. I saw, I on. saw. Yeah. Really interesting gal. Um, super fun interview with Lee. And I asked that question. I said, do you think that we're talking about it too much? Most people are, yeah. Because my, that was my fear that you're like, no, Zach, you have yep. trauma. And you're like, I don't think that I do. No, 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 no. Yep. You just don't understand. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. do. And then after, <laughs> you know, it's like watching a documentary. doesn't matter what the documentary is about. You're like, holy shit, they did fake the moon landing. And it's like, okay, well, that was one perspective. Like you only saw that perspective. 
Like, let's get the yeah. other half. Because the therapist is only going to give you potentially the, this is not a blanket, you know, all therapists. Mm -hmm. They're going to, their job is to discover what issues you have underlying and maybe they aren't necessarily there. And I asked her that. I was like, do you think that we're bringing things to the light that maybe didn't necessarily, um, not necessarily need to, but maybe didn't necessarily exist? And she said, no, she said, I think there's far more people that have things that they don't talk about than people who don't have things that they talk about. And I said, okay, that's, that's fair. I, I could see that. Yeah. You know, and again, there's a conversation of someone doing their own internal healing work or perhaps with a trusted guide. And then there's the institution of mental health. And that's a whole other thing. You know, that was originally my life path. I went to school for clinical psychology mm. and then I decided, no. um, but I did get my degree in psychology and whatever. It's what, uh, always been an area of interest. For me. What, why did you decide that wasn't for you? Well, the reasons back then were financial, partly. I, I had a higher aspirations than that of the average um, you know, clinical psychologist. And then also, I didn't want to ruminate in people's problems every day. And that's mm -hmm. the profession. And as a professional in the industry, you work with people often, I would imagine, who don't really want to actually get better and work with you and, and, mm. are, and do the work. And so I do private consultations myself and I help people just on a personal note, not even for money sometimes that have personal issues going on. But I also like to reserve the right to be like, bro, you're not taking action, yeah. you know, go away. Like you're wasting my time now, you know. Mm. But no, I've over time, as I've gone through my own personal journey, worked with a variety of people on personal issues that they've had going on. and. I think very positively impacted people's lives in a, I call myself a street psychologist. Mm. I don't know if that term could get me in trouble, but you know, it's like, I don't want to be in the official, you know, psychology room, but I, I very much enjoy helping people work through things that they have going on. Well, you talk about um, a street psychologist. I mean, that's almost like being a doctor who doesn't necessarily buy into everything that the big medical establishment is pushing. Which right? there's more and more of these days, I'm realizing. Which is a good thing, I think. And I yeah. think that the pendulum needs to swing in the other direction. Um, because if you're a doctor and you want to do things, like you want to buck the trend, there's just a big group of, of powerful entities, as we talked about, that are pushing against you. Like, I don't know if you've uh, listened to uh, Brigham, Brigham Bueller, I think. He owns Ways to Well. Super, super interesting guy. He's been on JRE twice. Really fantastic podcast. And I would say anyone who, like, kind of wants to hear about how the medical system actually works, he gives an extremely detailed discussion on it. Like, if I wanted, he being the doctor, if the doctor wanted to give you a full blood panel, full blood panel, like, a hundred different tests, and he would send that off to the insurance company. They'd be like, well, why does Zach need that blood panel? Like, what's going on? He's like, yeah. well, he's a really healthy young guy. And they're like, well, he doesn't need that. And he's like, well, but we want to check on him, see what's working, see what's not working, get a baseline for him. And then in the future, if something changes, we'll know. The insurance companies will just deny that, the whole thing. They're like, yeah. look, if we start to accept that, like this is going to fundamentally change our business. Like you can give them like five tests. He tests like his cholesterol, X or Y or Z. So in his idea, in his discussion, he's like, the, the systems don't really have your best interest at heart. They have like a pre-established system to do a very narrow set of things that are not necessarily best for you. So he stepped outside of that system and he's like, look, we're just going to be a cash pay medical company. I can do whatever I want for you. Mm -hmm. I'm a doctor and I can do these things for you. But we don't have to play by these insurance rules, which are yeah. very confining for you. Yeah, that's often the bottleneck. That's often the bottleneck, what insurance will cover. And that brings up the economical question and, again, the personal responsibility question of, okay, well, if you can't afford private care outside of what insurance will cover and you want that because you value that and you understand that you need or, you know, that is a better alternative, well, then there's some good incentive to do well financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, I do understand the argument that health care should be at some capacity like a, a, a right. Is it? Uh, I mean, Is I, it? I don't know. I guess like if, if I mean, tell me this, like, let's say uh, somebody tomorrow morning uh, or, or tonight, you know, you're staying in a hotel. 
somebody knocks on your your hotel room door and they you know have a gunshot wound in their shoulder they're not gonna probably die but it's in their shoulder it's serious Uh would you go hey dude not my business like because i don't think most people would i think most people would be like let's get you some help yeah yeah not like how much are you going to pay me to put a bandage on that shoulder? Yeah, I think well, I mean, like- again, you know, and, and then this brings up uh, all sorts of questions, right? Where is there a perfect solution in this imperfect world? But well said. is it a right for other people to give you health care or is it your God-given right and duty even to care for your health? I think it is your right and duty to care for your health. Absolutely. But... Every once in a while, shit happens, and you're like, yeah. I need some help. Like, if we're hiking <laughs> yeah, together, yeah. and you fall, and you break your leg, I'm going to be like, you shouldn't have been wearing those boots, dude. You should have <laughs> should have been training, dude. I'm going to be like, yeah. no, he's he's messed up. I'm like, <laughs> I might call you a wimp when we get back you know, to the trailhead, and I lug you out, but like, I'm going to help, obviously. Yeah. Well, so I think well, there's a balance, obviously. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily following the equation between man-to-man helping each other out on a personal level and systematic health care. For sure, for sure. There is a bit of a difference there between... Because I absolutely agree we should be helping each other out societally, individually. Yeah, well, um, how does the the saying goes? It's like, with my family, I'm a communist. With my friends, I'm a socialist. (laughs) At the state level, I am a, a Democrat. At the larger level, like the regional level, I'm a Republican. And then at the uh, total government, all nation level. I'm a libertarian. Essentially, like <laughs> as the government uh-huh. and system gets larger, you have less trust for the people involved. Uh-huh. So you need more autonomy, uh-huh. right? And and I think that's kind of what you're hitting on. That do I think that the federal government should be in charge of our healthcare? Absolutely not. I don't think that they're good at the things that they do. I think they've proven that time and time again that they are not capable of it. Do I think if I'm paying? 37.5% in federal taxes, I should be able to get something for that? Yeah. I think so. Well, that brings up the question of, is it gross negligence or is it gross malevolency? I, I think that it's stupidity. Some combo with the I, I think it's stupidity, honestly. I think there's uh, the saying, like, don't attribute to a conspiracy what could be contributed or attributed to stupidity. <laughs> it's like, I, I think that's like how it was with COVID. Like, you could say this was some huge grand conspiracy. I just think that it was just a lot of, dumb scared people who just were like what do we do you got to do something Mm. and then they just like panicked and were like this is it and they were making bad decisions on the fly that we sort of gave them the authority to make those decisions for us and as stated you know at that federal level we were not uh you know libertarians any longer we were like on that lower level we were communists like we're gonna do what you tell us to do and that's that so i don't know i think there's a balancing act there to be had I think, uh, yeah, I'm somewhere else in the spectrum in that. Yeah, but, you yeah, know, that's it fine, is what it you is. Know? That's fine. You know, you don't have to agree with me. Uh, of course, of course. You know, um, well, let's, uh, let's take a quick break. I'm going to grab another water, man. Sure, sure. So um, one thing we didn't cover, you covered a lot of things to remove out of your life. Are there things that you encourage people? And let's also say this, like, this is just general health, right? This yeah. isn't going to just only help heal from cancer or other various diseases. I presume that you would indicate that these are going to be helpful for prevention also. Yeah, because when we go back to the fact that cancer is kind of just the body's alarm bells and sirens wailing that Mm. things in the body are unhealthy, then yeah, we understand that the same things that'll keep you healthy are the same kind of things that might help with cancer and the same kind of things that'll help it not come back. Mm. Um, So you, the question was what to add to yeah, the body. You've already subtracted, you know, various types of bad water, bad uh, cosmetics, bad foods, um, you know, potentially bad behaviors. What are yeah. things that maybe you'd say, like, we've removed that, let's add this? I guess if you want to add something, we could talk about adding the sunlight that we just talked about, okay. adding emotional regulation practices okay. you know whatever that might look like for you breath work meditation sure all yoga. the above yeah just conscious existence overall yeah. add in the habits of gratitude journaling yeah whatever works for you um what else to add what about exercise yeah that was the next one definitely add in some exercise but then on the flip side of that 
add in proper recovery work because a lot mm. of people forget about that one. It's less sexy, right? Yeah. People just think exercise, 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 but the body can accrue a lot of imbalances and things that need fixing more so than just rest and more so than just, you know, pushing on and pushing forth. And so recovery practices such as, you know, salt baths are good, Epsom salt, warm mm. baths. Yep. I love a good but, bath. Yeah, even back to the clinical shiatsu guy I was talking about before, sometimes we do need a helping hand. And sometimes, you know, some medicinal massage can be a very good thing. And I certainly recommend vetting a practitioner because if someone's working with your body at a deep level like that, they can also do harm. Mm. But a proper medical massage practitioner, shiatsu is one art, but there's several others as well, can uh, certainly certainly do some good and certainly is needed in some times because certain things get tucked away in the body physically or emotionally that do need to be pushed out. Do you have preferences or <clears throat> things that you lean towards when it comes to exercise, cardio, uh, inside, outside, weight training, nah, I don't like high that. intensity, low intensity. Yeah. So I used to be a maniac bodybuilder okay. and, and did kind of the bodybuilder side of things. Now I'm just functional. I actually just work out right in my office. My home office is in my home gym. There you go. So anyone who sees my podcasts or any video I'm on when I'm at home will see behind me is just my weight setup. Um, so I just do quick functional stuff throughout the whole day. Okay. If I'm awake, I'm flipping back and forth between doing whatever I'm doing and doing a couple sets, doing whatever I'm doing, doing a couple sets. So I kind of just do that all day. And then sometimes I do say, okay, for the next half hour, I'm going to do more things. These days I keep it functional. I am still um, healing from a injury, so I, I'm a little limited in certain motions and certain you know weights, so uh, not to exacerbate that anymore. But uh, I, I like to keep it functional these days. When you say functional, that's like I'm not going for long max range movement patterns, things like that. Yeah, like mobility. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going for like max weight or max bulk muscles. I want to keep my body healthy and able to do things throughout life. And I'm not necessarily into like crazy calisthenics. I'm certainly not against them. I'm just not doing them currently. I'm doing like light, low intensity, but then, you know, high reps and, and lots of stretching and mobility. Mm. Once I get the total green light from my injury recovery, perhaps, you know, that'll change, but um, that's what I'm doing. Mm. It's, and that's not a one size fits all prescription for anyone, you know? But I certainly would advise people to be careful of being a maniac bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there's definitely the capacity to overdo it. And there's a difference between being fit and being healthy, right? Like, well, look, look at someone like Lance Armstrong, fit guy, cancer. So it's like, hmm, that's a, that's a weird thing there, you know? Um, not to say that he wasn't uh, healthy. Maybe you could say that everything else checked out, but he did obviously have cancer. So that's a weird one. It's like, what yeah. do you do with that? You know? Yeah, exactly. And you know, health is hard to kind of put someone in a box with and mm -hmm. say, this person is a healthy person, perhaps in this capacity, this capacity, this capacity, and this one they're lacking. And then it's okay, you know, when, uh, or, or, you know, it's as okay as it is, but you know, there, there's all sorts of ways that people can get things right and, and ways that people can improve. Are there any more new age type things, techniques, therapies, uh, that you do like and appreciate? Or is it all, well, what, like, what are you classifying uh, and quantifying? therapy. Peptides, okay. I dig that. Yeah. Cold baths. Uh -huh. Um, you know, cryogenic. Mm -hmm. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think red light is great. I think red light has a lot of seemingly unskewed and unbiased science behind it. I don't particularly have a red light machine with me, but I do think it's something that I will implement in the future. I got one. I just got one and nice. started using it. Nice. How, how does it feel? I don't really feel anything yeah. yet. I mean, <laughs> I'm doing well, you, yeah. mine's, What's the, the, mine's not huge. It's mm -hmm. like maybe like two feet tall by one foot wide. So it's like a decent sized panel. It's about 400 bucks. Um, so not cheap, but not like two grand, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll use it on my face and hair basically every day. And then I've had a lingering ankle injury that I'll use it on most days for about 10 minutes. And I would not say that I feel anything different yet, but I've yeah. maybe only had it for 60 days. So 
I'll keep it going. Yeah. Even if I feel nothing, I'll keep it going. <laughs> yeah. So red light, um, again, I haven't implemented it. It seems like a good idea. I look forward to implementing it or at least trying it out. The next thing you said was cold baths and, and cryo. I'm team hot. I'm team warm. I'm okay. team heat. Yeah. I, I don't like cold. Yeah. Like well, nobody, I think, likes it. I mean, it's just it's semi-painful. Well, when I say know. like, I mean, like, I don't. I'd prefer to have warmth for healing. I think warm loosens things up, gets things flowing. I think sometimes swelling and, you know, inflammation can be the body trying to send nutrient rich blood to an area Mm -hmm. and perhaps toning that down with cold can be not so good. I think there's also when you immerse your entire body in it, can have some negative effects there. Oh, well, it's definitely cortisol, powerful. Et There's no doubt that it is very yeah, powerful. Yeah, I, I, uh, you won't find me in a cold bath. Okay, all right. Uh, sauna, then hot bath. Sauna, yeah, heat. Yeah, yeah. I, I take pretty regular baths. It's, isn't it funny that like? There's a conception out there that if guys take baths, it's like wussy or like wimpy. <laughs> that's so odd. That's fine, bro. Have your tight muscles and injuries. Then. Yeah, that's fine. Right. I don't care. You know, think I'll of- tell people, yeah, I'm probably just going to like take a bath tonight. They'll be like, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm like, take, you think hot water is gay? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like, yeah. what if I'm in a, uh, um, uh, I want to wham. A hot, hot tub? tub. Yeah. 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 What if I'm in a hot tub? Like, is that get? No, that that's fine. But a bath, that's that's weird. And I'm like, you have some weird lines that you have drawn on this. And it's thing. interesting because obviously that's a that's a modern American thing, right? When you look at things like you know Russian bathhouses yeah, yeah. and, and you know Turkish bathhouses, it's it's traditionally a a known a time. masculine and male experience, and not mm-hmm. looked at in any sort of negative. Yeah. Uh, what about like uh, peptides or stem cells or those things you, you know, think to, thought about? Maybe like I'm getting a sign from God because you are like the fifth person in the last two weeks to ask me about peptides. Mm. And I don't particularly have an answer. It's not something I specifically looked into. I have heard some good things about them. I have not done my research. Into them. I've done a handful of different peptides. Um, I'm currently doing BPC-157. Um, I've heard of that one. I've heard that's like one of the really I've popular I've heard that one ones. highly regarded. Yeah. Um, I would say, again, I'm using it on my ankle. Um, I've used it on more like acute injuries. This is like a long-term what is it? You, you apply injury. it topically? I, I don't even know. Like, what do you mean you're using it on your There's ankle? There's a variety of different ways to use it. I inject. So I inject oh, okay. right into the joint. Well, then you lost me there. I don't like, yeah. like injecting. Yeah, well, that's, that's fine. I totally, you know, I, and a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but yeah. the way that I understand it is that first and foremost, if you take this as a pill, it's going to basically break up in your stomach acid. Like your stomach acid just like kind of consumes it, if yeah. you will. You might get some minor effects, but not necessarily. Now, so, just because I said I don't like or you lost me there, it doesn't mean it's not. I think it's not effective, right? Yeah, I just, right. I don't like it. So I, I, dude, I was with you. Like when I, when I first was like researching this, I was like, oh, dude, I just don't know if I can like yeah. do like an injection. That's yeah, yeah, so yeah. great. That's so metal. <laughs> and, uh, I eventually just was like, all right, dude, like I want to try something for this ankle, this mm-hmm. ankle. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, so I had, uh, well, I tore my uh, Peronis brevis, um, which is a ligament on the outside of your ankle. Probably when I was like 16 okay. and then didn't have surgery at that time. You're 16, dude. You're like, you're invincible. Um, played, you know, four years of college soccer, played four years of, uh, Four years of high school, four years of college. Had another bad ankle injury when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Basically, same exact rolling yep. uh, of the ankle. And then when I was out of college, like probably two years or three years later, I was playing in like pickup games and stuff. And this is going to sound nasty, but I would just feel the ligament like pop around the ankle bone. Mm-hmm. So you could just feel like it just slid to the other side of the ankle bone mm-hmm. and it would get stuck. And I would have to like sit here and like, crank on it yep. and like try to like jimmy it to get it to slide back to the other side yep um what was actually happening was i had a tear uh horizontally uh down the middle of it and it would split and then it would wrap around the ankle bone and i would have to like yep. manually push it back in it's gross trust me i understand i've had my veins and nerves and lymph nodes all manually manipulated yeah. to and fro and back into place so i i get it so i had that uh fixed and 
dude, you talk about like bad medical experiences. I think this doctor was a hack job and you know, I'm like 24. Like I don't know how to vet a doctor. I just think they're all really good. You know, he's got all his certs and everything. Yep. Um, and I think he did just a really terrible job, honestly. Mm. And then, um, from that I've had like kind of continuing issues. And then I had footballers ankle at the front of my ankle joint. Mm -hmm. Basically what that is, is just like trauma at the front of your ankle joint and you get these little fractures. Yep at the front of the ankle and it's just a common thing apparently with soccer players footballers ankle so they go in there and they like clean it up you know again i, I yeah and yet here you are wearing the wrong shoes the, oh yeah i know people hate these and and i do a lot of barefoot too but i don't know man i mean i've, I've had people that i know who they've had great experiences with barefoot shoes and then I have people I know that have like bad experiences. That's Define bad experience. What does a bad experience mean? Does they feel mean like their feet have been worse off afterwards, like more injured or less durable, I guess. I don't know. Well, experiences vary. And let's break it down very simply, right? For anyone that doesn't understand what we're talking about, barefoot shoes are shoes that instead of altering the natural dynamics of the foot and mechanics of the ankle, which then affect the mechanics of the knees and the hips and the spine and the pelvis and everything, part of your, every part of your body, barefoot shoes more so mimic the art of act of working, walking barefoot. So they generally have zero drop, which means your heel is at the same level as the front of your foot. So it's a flat shoe. They generally have a very thin sole. So a range from one to two millimeters to, you know, some people still call seven, eight millimeters barefoot. And they generally don't offer ankle support and foot support and arch support and all, all this stuff. It's, it's flat. And generally that's coupled with a nice wide toe box that allows feet to be shaped like feet instead of trying to shape feet like shoes. Mm. So that's what a barefoot shoe is definitionally. Why is that a good idea? And why can it actually cause or contribute to negative sensations for someone switching to it? Well, imagine you walked around from the time that you were little on crutches. You crutches under your armpits. Mm -hmm. You walked around on crutches, you walked around on crutches, you walked around on crutches for 10, 20 years. Then all of a sudden you drop the crutches and you go start running around you think you're not going to get fucked up? Yeah. You think you're going to be, you know, it's no, your feet essentially have atrophied and have developed unhealthy, you know, you have developed unhealthy walking patterns and gates and, and could potentially have imbalances and, and tilts and all these different things that are unnatural now. And you expect to go back to it, which is a harder thing to do. It's harder to hit the ground mm. that's impact you know that, that's a difficult thing when you're used to being padded and cushioned and so yeah there's certainly a lot of growing pains if you try to catch your feet and ankles up to speed after 10 20 30 years of you know allowing them to atrophy do you have brands that you like um uh, what what do you what's your kind so of right, go-to right now i just have the amazon specials Witten. Witten. W H I T I N. It's just okay. a generic Chinese barefoot shoe. They were yeah. like 30, 40 bucks and have, they're pretty uh, good. I also have a uh, Fai use. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm probably the same that. factory with yeah, a different probably, label. Yeah. There's also Hobie bear, which is the same shoes, okay. different label. <laughs> so the Amazon specials there, they're cool. Uh, Vivo is a well, yep. more well-known brand. They seem to have a higher quality construction. I've heard seen feedback that they're sometimes a little too narrow. Um, obviously experiences will vary but they do seem good in construction. If you want to go on the extreme end and you don't care about yourself socially, oh, you no. could go with the Vivos. The toe, oh, no, no, no. The, the Vibrams. The Vibrams. The toe, Dude, toe shoes. those are awesome. Those I, I are that. awesome, awesome shoes. Again, you will suffer socially, but they are fantastic. Yeah, maybe You'll also suffer in the winter. Mix them in. Cold. You probably, you know, you don't have to wear them everywhere you go. You mix them. Oh, in. I did for a while though. Yeah. I'm extreme. Yeah, I'm extreme. Do you feel like your feet are better off Dude, now significantly? My feet are strong. What was the? What was like? What experience did you have? Like going from normal shoes to mid level to like all the way to those vibrams? 
Oh, I'm extreme. I went right to you the went vibe straight rooms. To I went straight to the vibe rooms. <laughs> Just went into the pain cave right away. Yeah, and I did everything. 24-7 vibe rooms, um, hiking, this, that, the other. And yeah, sometimes it hurt. But I was also conscious of it. I would make sure I was walking nice and straight. And, you know, okay, if I need to take a break, take a break, you know, from a long walk or, you know, take a break for a couple of days. But yeah, my feet are strong. Mm. Ankles are strong. And it's interesting. Like, yeah. I had an experience where I was wearing the all terrain models or whatever. And I was hiking with a buddy of mine who's military and he was wearing these like high grade army approved boots bro he was falling and tr like sliding all around the trail mm. and i was just gripping not even having to hold on to anything and here he was like losing traction all over the place and i'm just br <laughs> those are leather ones those oh, look wow. a little crazy those are um so the ones i have the ugliest shoes that i've ever seen in my the whole ones life. i have are the v alpha the all-terrain ones i have they're not, they're not the most aggressive one, but they are the um, altering. And then I have the KSO Evos for the more lightweight one. Yeah, they're awesome. So yeah, the, you blue, wanna, the blue is hitting. You want to see like something black. crazy. You've probably seen this, Steve. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. But uh, just Google search. Look at the like, black. Not even that. Google search uh, like feet of Amazonian people. Yeah. Have you seen this? Of course. Yeah. So there, there seems to be like some conversation about what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Bare feet. There seems to be some conversation about what's going on. If you're just listening, kind of what happens with these images. Go to, go to the images. Yeah. Uh, well, go to Amazonian because now you're what getting the literally. The, oh, there's on one here? on the right hand side. The Indians splayed feet. Yeah. So. There seems to be some conversation going on about... Just scroll down to the right, uh, Steve, because you can see it there. There seems to be a lot of conversation going on. What's going on with these people? The tribe is the Hurani. For anyone who wants to like go look at this themselves, it's H-U-A-O-R-A-N-I. These people proverbially walk through the jungle barefoot, and their feet have become almost hand-like. They have... They've got an extremely wide feet. God. Their feet are probably twice as wide as my feet. And they're almost bowed out to the point that it looks like you're taking your hands and like making sort of like a diamond out in front of you. Now, bear in mind, they could also be a bit splayed for the photo. I think that they believe that sort of like evolutionarily, like something has kind of occurred with these people's feet. That's a pretty normal one there on the left. Um, yeah, that's a little more normal, but, but in essence, these people's feet have gotten very wide and strong because they're constantly walking around barefoot yeah. and yeah, the bodies use it or lose it. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Um, the bodies use it or lose it. And now the morons will now see that. And then think, oh my God, I don't want to wear barefoot shoes. I don't want to look like that. As if they're ever going to fucking look like that. Yeah, that's like, you know, what, what people said to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, oh, I'd never want to look like you. He's like, you're not going to look like <laughs> me. Don't worry. Like, that's not going to happen yeah. to you. Um, well, man, um, let's transition. I know this is a topic sure. near and dear to your heart. Uh, one that I asked you about on the break. Uh, male circumcision. I saw that on your Facebook that this is something clearly you've thought a lot about. Um, I told you I was joking with my friends about this sort of, and they're like, don't, don't talk about that. That's weird. And I'm like, well, wait, why is it weird? Like, this is something that happens every single day yep. to basically every single American baby. Um, how did you sort of like get made aware of this issue? Most people don't even think it's an issue. It's just like, well, yeah, no, know. it's, it's certainly an issue. It's certainly an issue for all of society, for men, for women, for everyone. Alike. Um, how did I become made aware of it? Well, just as I was looking into holistic health and wellness and just diving down all the different rabbit holes of health, well, part of that involves looking down the health of a man and kind of doesn't get any closer to men's health issues and our genitals themselves. And mm -hmm. Close to home, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, once you open that door, it's uh, a lot of information to unpack. Mm. 
So what is your stance then on the practice of circumcision? I think if a consenting adult wishes to alter their body, that is their right. I think if it is done to a non-consenting individual, be it an infant, a child, or anyone else, then it is knife rape. Mm. It is genital mutilation, and it is knife rape. Well, it's interesting because we don't seem to have any issue. Literally, the term for it when it occurs to females is female genital mutilation. Like you, that you can yes. just search it FGM is, is and that is definitional what comes mutilation. Up. Yes. But then when it comes to men, they're just like, eh, well, that's not a, like, that's just yeah. what we do. Yeah. Um, Morons. Imagine, so, imagine a society so fucked up that that is the standard procedure and it goes about. So, but let me kind of be devil's advocate here. What about like the, uh, the medicinal uh, lies benefits? Lies. There are none. What about uh, sexually transmitted diseases? Because isn't it true that people who don't have a foreskin have a lower risk and or ch uh, chance of acquiring some sexually transmitted diseases? Lies. Doesn't matter. I don't care what numbers anyone wants to throw out made up. Garbage. Logically flawed and failed. Mm. Nonsense excuses to purport genital mutilation to traumatize a public and then sell the foreskin. Well, wait, hold on. Sell the foreskins? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, you think they just throw them out? I would assume so, uh, but I guess I don't know. No, they do not. They sell them for all sorts of nefarious uses and perhaps for face creams as well. I have seen that there is some foreskin face cream stuff going on. Um, was it, wasn't it Oprah that got in trouble for this? It, Oprah was off about it. Sandra Bullock. Uh, not Sandra. Yeah. Miss Congeniality. Come on. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know what happens with the foreskins. I would hope they're dis disposed of. But I do know that that, um, and anyone here can Google it, like the foreskin face cream Oprah controversy, there was like this thing going on. And it's very popular in like some Asian countries, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but that is the contention that most people would make is that there's a health benefit to it. There's just not. So let's, let's just, just not. knock if, it if, out. If you want to yeah, throw anyone out, the, they're just garbage. They're all garbage. Well, I think, uh, you know, probably the most damning uh, piece of evidence to that argument that it decreases um, sexually transmitted diseases would be, okay, well, then the U.S. should have some of the lowest sexually transmitted disease rates in the world. Mm -hmm. But that's not accurate. We actually have quite high yeah. uh, um, incidences of sexually transmitted diseases amongst the, like, uh, established yeah. Western it, it world. It just doesn't make sense. Let's think about it. Well, one, you can't transmit a disease that you don't have in the first place. And two... If you do have a disease or you don't, you know what stops the transmission or receiving of, trans, or of sexually transmitted diseases? Not having sex with people that have sexually transmitted diseases. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, that opens the door of all this normalization of sexually transmitted diseases, and that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm saying? So it's like, and let's, what are the logistics of that? How? Is there less, is there not the fluid coming I out think now? That, the, I guess, the, the concept is that the foreskin will not trap bacteria. Yeah, that's that and then, what I would you know, hear. The bacteria won't, um, you know. Uh, just be hanging around. Just kind of lingering yeah. around. It's just lingering. But then, all right, so what are we doing for women? They, their genitals well, have a good point. more uh, accumulation of bacteria than even an intact male. So it's, it, it's, it's just a nonsense. It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Hmm. And then and any of it could be remedied by proper washing with water. Right, right. I would have to think it, that it makes just no sense. basic sanitary practices that anyone would generally uh, undergo should yeah, be. Yeah, and like you said, the statistics are inverse to making that a point that's yeah. valid versus the statistics of the rest of the world. What about people who say, well, I do it for like a religious reason? I don't care. I am intolerant of genital mutilation for any reason. I don't care. You know, I understand that someone might be doing it for their child and thinking that that will help their child's relationship with God. It's still genital mutilation, and I still think it is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, and no matter what, it is still physically and emotionally and spiritually detrimental. Mm -hmm. For and it's irreversible. So I think if it want if a parent decide, wants it to be done for you know spiritual reasons it would be more appropriate to allow that young boy to then become a man and make a decision for himself if he would like to join that cult or not mm. 
Um, what about people who say that it's a uh, part of the Christian faith? Because I know that's uh, one of the sort of arguments. Because mo- yeah. predominantly in the I'm United not, States, we have Christian faith. I'm not a religious scholar. I've been exposed and have some experience in all of the three major religions. My father comes from Jewish lineage. My mother is Muslim. And I grew up in a Catholic Christian community. There you go. I think that the practice of circumcision in a religious sense came from the Jewish origins who have a lot of blood sacrifice rituals, is what it is. And they have a particular influence in medical establishments within the United States, and I think they convinced the world to do it. Mm -hmm. The way that I understand it is that um, it is not part of the Christian faith, but it has sort of been like, Somehow. Culture. It's culture. It's got. It's it culture. Got moved into the like. People it's, are like, wait, I do it for the Christian faith. It's Jewish religion. It's cultural, otherwise, and made to think that it's Christianity or Islam. Well, it is culturally um, normalized, which is the funny thing because, like, if you if you say this to someone else, if you say it to a guy, well, like, you know, yeah, like I, I'm I'm an intactivist, which is I think a funny term, but um, it's a good one. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm an intactivist. They go, girls don't like guys who uh, are uncircumcised. And I'm like, what gives you uh, you, want, you, Im- you want to dive into that? Impression at well, all. Yeah, so that's societal programming on the female's part. But yeah. biologically, they prefer it. Their bodies are designed to receive an intact male. And mm. so when you change Makes the sense. physics of the male genitals, you change how sex is experienced on all sides. And mm. so... All the sexual dysfunction we have in the modern world, a lot of it is a result of circumcision. Mm. Not just, so it could go both ways on the male side. There's premature ejaculation and uh, inability to finish and ejaculate. Mm -hmm. Those can both be attributed to circumcision. I could dive into those. But then on the female side, female dissatisfaction because of the increased friction and now the foreskin that's meant to be a barrier to hold the natural lubrication in has been removed. So then the glands of the penis then becomes like a shovel just pulling out the lubrication that's mm. caused the drying out, that causes the friction. And even if a woman doesn't understand what's going on at a conscious level, her body subconsciously knows what's going on. Mm. Her body subconsciously is dissatisfied. And that leads to resentment and a, and a shying away from sex and a feeling like they're the problem and a feeling like, their body's wrong when really it's it's not the man's body that's not intact. Well, it's a very new thing, you know. Generally, we, I mean, what do you there mean? were there were no cave dwellers that were like, we should cut off part of our penis. You know what we should, dude? Do? It's fucking crazy. It's barbaric, man. It's, it's barbaric. absolutely barbaric. People think the dark ages were long ago, yet we're living in a society that mutilates the genitals of one of its genders. Yeah, and it's, the it's become not only um, normalized, but just celebrated and, and the natural bit of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and people, again, as stated, they go, well, it looks better. It's like, well, you're, yeah, it's a weird take. That's like saying, well, guys look better when you cut their nose off. It's like, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't, I guess you could convince yourself that that's true, but yeah. you know, it's hard for me to understand that. One thing that I saw that you posted that I had never heard before, but it makes mm-hmm. total sense. Um, was there was those scientists that had uh, a, a young per a baby mm-hmm. baby attached to uh, an EKG. fMRI machine was it an EKG I believe so okay T- you want to just go ahead and talk about that study yeah well when you take an infant or a young baby who knows nothing of this new world other than mother and mother will protect me strip them away from their mother, strap them to a board in front of fluorescent lights and a bunch of strangers, and then mutilate the most sensitive part of their body with knives or other devices that then crush it and then slice it. Yeah, that's kind of confusing to that baby. And that's a lot of pain. And the brain can't process it. So the brain... She gets fucked up. Mm -hmm. The emotional processing centers and the logical processing centers both get fried in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the study allegedly uh, says that it never recovers. Mm. Well, it's kind of hard. And and some people will go, well, 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 wait a minute. They they put the baby under anesthesia. No, they don't. Well, wait a minute. They give the baby like some local anesthesia. Sometimes they do. They'll give them some amount of local anesthesia. But- 
And unfortunately, this is this is sad and gruesome. But if anybody doesn't really believe us, go watch one. Go, go fucking watch a, video, watch a video. Go watch a video, and then go watch a video of the rabbi sucking it after. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that part I I don't know if I can do watching a video for that. But um, if you watch a video, the baby is absolutely howling. They are making like guttural screams. Yeah. They know something's going on. Uh, and it's in, it's not like, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you had a, like a, a, an ACL surgery that you didn't go under for and they give you like a nerve block and your legs all blocked up and you're just like sitting there and like watching it, but not feeling it. Clearly that is not what is going on. Yeah. And people don't necessarily even understand the anatomy that is being cut off. So first it's not, it's not just a, a cutting of skin. Right, because we all we could all kind of relate to what it's like to have a slice on our on our skin, but it's more than that. Before the foreskin is cut, there's different methods. There's different clamps. There's different tools, etc. Sometimes it's just freehand with a knife. They all have their assorted ways that they're barbaric and painful. But I don't want to interrupt you. But it's it's quite common that that cutting process doesn't go perfect. <laughs> yeah, and, How, you're working on something small. Yes, yes. and and um, have a blade what, what can happen around. i know one of the things that can happen is if um the the tension the pressure isn't right on left and right um the penis can become curved like permanently curved because there's more skin pressure on one side mm -hmm. than on the other yeah well yeah that, that that's complicated that that's on the good side of complications mm. and then the far side is total amputation and all sorts of shit which but, does happen which does happen and actually i think every year there's a couple of or um, death there's a couple of deaths every single year, I believe, from yeah, this. There's death from what is what amounts to a, a procedure that doesn't have any medical benefit. Correct, and has a large amount of detriments. Um, so this that was that's a bad case too. This David uh, Reamer, um, if I'm pronouncing his name right, but basically, um, he was raised as a girl because during his yeah. uh, circumcision, his penis was severely injured during a botched circumcision. There's no such a thing as a circumcision a where the penis does not become severely essentially, injured. Essentially, his penis was cut off. And unfortunately, I did not know this, but he died by a suicide via gunshot. Well, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, age 38. And he actually did not even know that he was supposed to be a boy. He realized that he was not a girl between the age of 9 and 11. He was, he was yeah. Anyway, I mean it, dude. It's yeah. gruesome, you know. So I mean, yeah, so I was breaking down what it actually yeah, is because apologies. people don't understand that the foreskin itself is not a separate thing from the penis. It is the penis, and it is actually so inherently the penis that it is fused to the glands. As a, as in, in, at some point in the future, it's sort of like yes, during during puberty, through you know just natural movement, etc., and, and natural exploration, the Fusing layer generally, um, you know, breaks up, Releases and then, then it becomes uh, mobile. But before that, just like our fingernails are attached to our fingers, mm. it is fused to the mm. glands. And so first, that has to be severed and ripped off. Mm. So everyone can right there imagine ripping off your fingernail. Now imagine that's on your genitals that are far more sensitive than even your finger. And now we can start to understand what's going on. So immediately, that's mm. trauma. And then, yeah, then there's the crushing. Some, <laughs> some of it, times it's just straight up blade. Sometimes they cut off the blood circulation so much that it just uh, goes into necrosis and mm. like falls off later. There's, there's a couple different ways that it's done. And yeah, that's hugely detrimental and um, painful to an infant. Again, who doesn't understand what's going on. Yeah, nor can you honestly even begin to explain to that baby for... No, all they know, know is ten years. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's never a good time. No, I mean, no. I mean honestly, the, the best time is right now. Though the best time is right now because it's easier f to accept it as a child than as an adult. The longer you have been lied to, the the worse it is generally. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to talk about the flip side though because this is a dark, dark hole, and what stops a lot of men from exploring this is the grief of coming to accept what may have been done to them but there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that's foreskin restoration i have and heard so of this i i do want to apologize because our conversation to this point has been a bit 
here or there. It's been a little less professional than I would like to be. No, on a very I think that that's topic. what we do, man. But I mean, yeah, you know, the, the physical detriments are plentiful, not just on the premature ejaculation or failure to finish. Uh, there's also the friction problem with women. Then there's a subconscious damage that this does in the woman's head because their body is not receiving good sex from their mate, even if they like it and they enjoy it, their body's experiencing this weird displeasure. Subconsciously, that creates a resentment and problematic you know, behaviors there, emotional patterns there. The male side of things, because the remaining nerve endings and obviously several tens of thousands are severed and no longer there and functioning pleasure organs are no longer there, the remaining nerve endings are calloused over and so pleasure is not able to be fully experienced in that regard either. The body doesn't is still seeking a full orgasm that's not available because the full sensation isn't uh, available to be received by the brain. And so this contributes to a lot of hypersexuality. Mm. And yeah, and, and in men, because you know how, you know, the common trope is that women have, you know, big orgasms and it's like a whole big deal. And men, it's like attributed or kind of downplayed into being like a little sneeze. Mm. Oh, you're just a little sneeze and you're done. Well, no, it is actually supposed to be as pleasurable and, mm. and whatever, but because all the nerve ed endings are severed and the remaining ones are calloused over, mm. then it's not experienced fully. And that leaves the male brain with kind of like a itch that you can't scratch feeling. Mm. And then that contributes to seeking it out more, like trying to fulfill that sexual uh, itch and you know, we obviously understand all the depravity of, that we see today. Is it an only factor? No. Does it behind the scenes contribute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've never heard that uh, perspective. Yeah, it, no, it's, it's huge. And um, then that could lead to problems in marriage in both directions and, and resentment, et cetera. And then the man wants more sex because he doesn't feel fulfilled. The woman wants less sex because she's subconsciously and, and you know, physiologically being irritated by the sex, mm. even if she doesn't realize it. Sexual tension, lack of sex, divorce, all, all these things. Mm. Anyway, so that's one side of the equation. Then there's the emotional side of things within the man, the lack of emotional regulation because his emotional processing centers have been damaged and that's hard to come back from, although possible. Then there's the inherent damage to his relationship with his mother. That's why circumcised males have difficulty breastfeeding mm. because there's just... That, that connections they feel like the mother has kind of forsaken them yeah if you will. yeah and then obviously there's a lot of other uh common practices that play into this kind of things going on there's always a lot of things going on but these are parts of the equation so then there's that then there's the constant friction that a man feels as he goes throughout his life on his you know under garments the constant friction on what is supposed to be an internal organ now being forced to be external right and right. he just learns to live with it and thinks that that's just how life is but that constant friction is always there subconsciously irritating him but then also causing a internal tensing of the pelvic muscles interesting which then leads to weak pelvises and then that leads to a horde of uh you know health issues etc and then can really ruminate throughout the entire body Couple that with improper footwear, causing a tilt of the pelvis usually, and most people's pelvises are, are erect. Pel mm -hmm. Pelvic uh, pelvic health and groin health are, are absolutely erect. And mm. yeah, and, and, and like you said, sometimes uh, there's variances on how much skin is left and or, or skin and mucosal tissue because inner foreskin is actually mucosal tissue. It's not skin. But yeah, that could cause tightness. Which can one, if it's even, even if it's even, not allow full erection, hmm. it can kind of hold it back. If it does that to an extreme degree, it can be extremely uncomfortable in, in all sorts of regards. Hmm. Uh, if it's uneven, it can cause the curving, et cetera, because more tension all the time. Yeah. Um, all, all sorts of issues. And we could go further and further and further. But. The light at the end of the tunnel is foreskin restoration. Mm. And that's an important part to talk about because okay. that's the actionable and that's the what can you do about it. You are here. What can you do about it? Mm. And that is essentially what you're trying to like, like re kind of restretch that area. Is that kind of what, how it works? So at its core, it's done via stretching, but it is actually cell mitosis. When you place 
cells and this, you know, parts of the body under tension, the body doesn't want to be under tension. So it will actually grow and recreate cells to not be under tension anymore. That's why just like stretching a muscle, you know, if you do it well enough, long enough, you you will stretch. the Yeah. Or like, you know, you see the Africans with the rings around their necks and they have long necks, et cetera, et cetera. The body will adapt. It's very interesting. Or like gauges in ears or lips or, you know, all the places people put gauges for some reason. Mm. But yeah, so there's different manual exercises you could do via hand, or there's devices that you could wear that place the remaining skin and intermucosal tissue under tension in a variety of ways. And then that tension over time then triggers cell mitosis. And there is an initial period of stretching out of the existing skin because the skin does have elasticity. But then over time, new cells do get grown. When you stop doing these practices, if you ever stop doing that, then that initial elasticity kind of tightens back up, but then the remaining cells are there for life. Mm. And then you regain a lot of what you've lost, but Mm. not 100%. But from much research and people that have experienced being an intact male and then were cut as an adult and then restored... Mm, it's that's, been that's a whole hell of a process. The numbers, yeah, and there's a lot of reasons that I've gone into that and stories there. But the numbers that I've kind of gathered are if being intact as God intended you to be is a 10 out of 10, being cut is like a 1.5 to 3, and being restored fully is like a I've seen 7.5 to 9 mm. to 9.5. All right. So what you can get back is the physics. What you can get back is the physics. Once you have a skin sheath, you can f- fully regain the physics of sex as intended. You're never going to re- regrow the nerve endings. Yeah. You're not going to regain nerve endings, but the nerve endings you have remaining will de-keratinize. Okay. So when an internal organ is made to be external, the body adapts. If you were to hold your tongue out, you sit and hold your tongue out, eventually it would dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up, yeah. and it would just become like husk, right? Yeah. And that's what penises have become. Crackled skin, it's dry, etc. That's a keratin layer that the body has put to protect what is supposed to be protected. Mm-hmm. And once the body no longer needs that, because then there's the protection via the regrown skin, that layer actually goes away and you get the supple feeling, uh, you know, healthy mucosal tissue back. Mm. If you've been blessed to have some remaining, some people have all of it cut off. Some, you know, there's, there's ranges, Mm. but you know, you can tension that and then, you know, grow more cells there. And so then that becomes a much nicer uh, sensation, depending on how much frenulum you've been left with. You could have some, all functionality of that. The frenulum is the triangle kind of skin, just like, again, at the bottom of our tongue that is meant to kind of guide the foreskin to being where it needs to be. Uh, And then at the end of the frenulum in an intact male is called the ridged band. It's itself its own organ, and it is the most uh, Mm. feeling and sensory part. But that's the kind of the propuse. I don't know how to say that word. But it's the organ at the tip that kind of keeps things closed at the at the tip and then rolls back and uh that's the most pleasurable area and that's what ribbed condoms copy Mm. and so you don't get that back if that's cut off and that usually is cut off at 100 percent of uh cuts but you don't get that back but if you could get to a 7.5 out of nine uh or 9.5 it is um and then for the female partners of a restored male, to my understanding, it, it's basically exactly the same. Hmm. So okay. that's cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's there's two things there. Obviously, individuals can think about restoration if they're circumcised, but I think the buck has just kind of got to stop with you. I mean, like you can't. Yeah. Don't don't, just, don't do just it to your kids. Yeah, yeah. This ridiculous thing. Um, even if you let's say let's say you do believe that there is a medical benefit, how can you make the justification that you are allowed to take something away from this child mm. at birth without their consent? Like, how do you make that justification yeah. that I choose for you? I, trust me, I'm smarter than you. Like, 20 years from now, you're going to thank me that I did this for you right now. Yeah. Like, 
Dude. And it's like, are you a believer in freedom? Are you a believer in autonomy? Are you yeah. a believer in liberty? Are you a believer in personal decision making? Because yeah. I am. So even if, uh, you know, whatever, my son does this research and decides in the future, this is what I want done. I'm like, cool, dude, you're a yeah. grown up. Like, go for it. Oh, exactly. And that, that's, I think, what I started the whole conversation with. If a consenting adult wants to do this to himself for some reason, then I think he's probably misinformed and misguided, but that's his right. Yeah. But I think people would say, well, once they're older, it's a more serious surgery. Nope. False. It's easier even because then the doctor can work with something full size rather that's than true. trying to, well, it you seems know. seems to make sense to me. Work on something small. Well, also, uh, you're much more, I don't know if people would agree with this, you're a lot more resilient at age 22. A baby could die from like a the cold. The fact that you, know? you even know what's going on. Yeah. And you're like, you know why you this can is make happening. a conscious decision. Yeah, it's emotions. like you're 22, you want to get a tattoo. It's like, dude, you know it's going to be there forever. You get to make that decision. Yeah. But I mean, to give a baby a tattoo, it's like, you didn't have a choice in that. Like, how do you know that he wants a heart that says mom on it yeah like, and it's like that's unfair of you to make that decision on behalf of that if individual. a parent had this done because you know in the i in, think in, what in, you're in, about in, to say in, has a real impact in the circles of you know people coming to comprehend the atrocities of this procedure and this thing that we have going on there's a lot of one victim grief because it is a victim you know i'm not a victim mindset person but you are a victim of knife rape if this was done to you. There's also heavy, heavy grief on parents that come to realize what they've done. If you have done this or had this done to your child and you genuinely thought at the time that you were doing something good, I don't think you're a bad person. I will look you in the eyes and think you're fucking stupid or were at that time and failed your child. You failed to protect your child. In fact, you did quite the opposite. You caused harm. That's the truth. Mm. But, you know, is what it is now. What Can't I, go back. I, and, and, you know, there's uh, that's a hard pill to swallow. But, you know, the truth is the truth. No matter what your feelings are about it. I don't think you're bad. You did something fucking stupid. Kudos for you for perhaps learning better. A lot of parents then learn better and do better for their future children instead of double tripling down and say, oh, well, I did one. I have to do them all. But um, so what I thought you were going to say. Well, yeah, what did you actually, think I was going to say? Yeah. I, thought, I thought you were going to say that if someone had it done to them, mm -hmm. they want to mentally normalize it. And they oh, don't, we could go into that. We they into don't want to go down the rabbit hole that like, we can go into that. wait a minute, my parents might have done something terrible to me. So instead they just go, this is normal mm -hmm. and we're just going to do it to little Johnny. Or yep. We're just going to do it. Yep. It was done to me. I'll do it to little Johnny, which yeah. is a, which is a cyclical abuse. It's cyclical it's, it's abuse, cyclical abuse cycles of trauma. And, and yes, because trust me, some people will come to realize what has been done to them and, and, and not really care. I am someone myself, and I'll, I'll get personal here. I am someone myself that very much cares about life and health optimization and having something so critical to existence as a man being your genitals and, and realizing the irreparable harm that had been done. You know, it, it, it caused a lot of grief, right? Especially thinking back to psychological things that went on perhaps between me and partners, et cetera. It's uh, to feel wronged without any agency or ever having a chance mm -hmm. and ever having a chance to truly write it. You know, that's uh, it's extreme. It's extreme. And so, you know, I, I understand it's a valid thing to feel a lot of grief about. And so I understand when those that perhaps are not as strong minded cannot do anything other than shy away from the truth it's also tough because especially if you have a good relationship with your parents true you go like my parents are great parents they were true like my parents were fantastic they were extremely loving um they would never have done something to harm me intentionally i firmly believe that they were they were like mm -hmm. super supportive and I, I don't want to say I've like confronted my parents. That's not really not true. But I've talked to them about this before. Yeah, that's good. And, and my mom just goes like, we didn't know. We didn't know any better, yeah. you know? 
And that's kind of that. But there's two ways that that could go. It could, it, it could be the dismissive, ah, we didn't know better. Eh, eh. Or they she's, could be like, ah, like, she's, shit, sorry, we didn't know better. You yeah, know, like, I, mean, so I, I think that she a little bit still kind of holds. Well, I don't think she holds any, um, um, you know, misnomers that mm. this is the right thing to do. But I think she's also like, look, every one of your friends is circumcised. Everybody you ever meet out there is circumcised. Again, that's not to say that like that makes it right. Mm -hmm. A thousand wrongs don't make one right. Yeah. But no. I think she, she was a product. Uh, she and my dad were a product of. It's just kind of how it was going. You know, I was yep. born in ninety one, and like I think that would have been extremely odd or rare at that time. So I, it was out. I there. get it. You know, and that's good for you in the sense that it sounds like forgiveness, uh, because holding on to resentment, you know, isn't good for anyone. Yeah, I mean, and, look, you know, if you're wearing Bluetooth headphones today and 30 years from now, it's discovered like, hey, that was like messing up your we don't have to. Ways. We don't have to wait for that one. Uh, we, we already know that. Yeah, but a lot of people are just like, dude, it's whatever, it's Bluetooth, you know what I mean? But yeah, like, and it's like... I get it. Could you go down the rabbit hole and look it up and do the science and do the... Yeah, but ready, 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 ready. Like, do we even need to fucking do that, right? Do we even need to have science tell us that it's not good to mutilate genitals? Shouldn't there I, have been I, something, some semblance of intuition in there, right? It's like we could still recognize, like I said, I think, hey, yes. you weren't a bad person for doing this. It was pretty fucking stupid, though. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I trust it, me, you I'm can with you. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> like, it's one of those things, I think, once you see the light, you can't unsee it, right? Uh -huh. It's just like, Unless you're oh, ostrich. Oh, it. yeah. Like, that makes a lot of sense that this is crazy. Yeah. You know, a lot, uh, and a lot of the craziness, you just, all you have to do is think about it. And if you have any semblance of intuition, you know what the fuck is going on. You know what the deal is. Well, um, but, you know, that said, um, this is a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I know. If, man, if, you if, said you go three, four hours on it. Yeah. Totally if anyone, that. you know, listening does ever want help on the topic, that's something I would very happily assist you know other men with for free or women understanding yeah. it for free um you know i offer paid consultations for different matters but this is something i would certainly do for free because uh it's important yeah i would just say look if you're if you're having a baby if your friends are having a baby you know like, i've saved babies i have specifically I had I people oh, come to me you have and say you we did issue. not do that to our son because of the information you've posted online and wow that's amazing yeah, well, that's that's impressive, man. Let's end on a, an exciting note, a happy sure. note, man. Tell, yeah, me, yeah, tell yeah. me something that uh, that's exciting for you or something that's making you really uh, happy in the current moment in time. Oh, man, so many things, my friend. Uh, overall, broad spectrum, I think we're seeing a lot of beauty in the world amongst all the chaos, I think, is a behind-the-scenes movement of the pendulum swinging into the powers of good having more power than they have had for a long time in this fight of good versus evil. So broad spectrum overall in life, I think we have a lot of beauty ahead of us. More specific to me, we at thecancer.org are revamping everything. We are restructuring and changing everything and bringing so many improvements to our products, both the free ones and the paid courses. And through that, we will continue to be able to best help those need with uh, cancer unnecessarily. So that's super exciting. And that, that's kind of something that's been a major area of work for me like when i get back to my hotel tonight i'm on my computer changing the website around doing these things we're adding more community elements to it we're adding more experience to the product itself we're adding more modules we're yeah um that's something specifically i'm, I'm very excited about sweet man and uh the podcast yeah, and the podcast. So my podcast has 20 episodes released right now. Oh, yeah. I have over 20 already recorded, just waiting into uh, in queue to very edit nice. and publish. Talking about all sorts of things, man. Meeting very fascinating people. And I just really intend to bring interesting and actionable conversations to people that they might not have considered previously that they could use to improve their life in some capacity. I've had conversations on everything from healing sexual abuse trauma to you know obesity to uh, psychology and psychiatry to ancient jewish mysticism and the kabbalah i saw that to uh color therapy and art therapy and mm -hmm. holistic senior care and how do we address the issue with senior citizens and and so 
every, I'm really just having all these interesting conversations. Um, biological dentistry. That was a good I one. I saw that. That was a very good one. I, I highly recommend watching that because dentistry is a very corrupted area of health. You know, un, not unlike most others, but mm. it's an easy actionable to just go to a biological dentist instead of a uh, conventional. Mm. Didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, yeah. Biological dentistry is the school of dentistry, essentially applying terrain theory, and so it's holistic dentistry within the realm of terrain theory instead of, instead of germ theory. And the episode itself is with a highly regarded. She's the associate director of the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine, mm. and so she was a wonderful guest to have on the topic, and she brought a lot of good information. Mm. And she's pretty funny, so. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> well, you know, something that I just recently heard is that uh, pride is refusing to admit that you're wrong. And being open-minded is just allowing yourself to admit that you've been wrong. But I think a lot of things you're saying is just let, let your pride down a little bit and maybe don't go, well, that's bullshit, before you go, well, well, well hold on. Mm. What do you actually know about this? How about you listen to a little bit more and... You know, something I was thinking before you came on, just trust your body a little bit. Trust your gut. Trust your mind. You know, if something feels right, try it out. Go yeah. for it. You know, I always tell people, just experiment. Experiment without doing deal. Yeah, be your dude. own scientist. Absolutely. Be your own scientist, right? Why are we outsourcing science? We can do science. I do science all the time. And of one, dude. I'm the single man study, dude. <laughs> yeah, there you go. What's it like when you stop using deodorant? If, you're, if your life yeah. turns terrible, like, okay, that's not for you. Try something different, yeah. you know? What's it like if you stop washing your hair or you go to barefoot shoes or you change your shoes out? Like, is things better or worse? Like, and I think so many people just don't, have that mindset that they're willing to try something different and see what happens. I think a big part of the mindset shift too, though, is people have compartmentalized thinking mm. instead of holistic thinking. Like we said, you stop using deodorant and you get, okay, a smell. Is that because you stopped using deodorant or is there other things going on, right? Or you, you know what I'm saying? The, there's mm -hmm. uh, People have this compartmentalized view of, really everything you know it's like mm. this is this and this is this and this and then the body is is so much more nuanced and so much more systematic i think people that. just want simple explanations man yeah people it's, are lazy it's, people it's, are lazy it's hard to think okay i stink does that like was that my diet is that my exercise is yeah. that my mental state is that you know the fragrances that i'm using is that the plastic chair that i'm sitting in it's easier to just yeah. go, I stink. That's uh, because everybody stinks. I put on deodorant and fixed it, and boom, yeah. I move on with my life. So. External issues are just symptoms of internal issues. The external ones are just the ones that we see or hear or smell or whatever. Mm. Zach, where can people find you, man? Where's the various channels for you? So my website is ZachTheHealthKing.com. That's Z-A-K, TheHealthKing.com. If you spell Zach wrong, you'll still end up in the right place anyway. Nice, smart. Yeah. Um, you can find the links to my podcast on the assorted platforms there. It'll also have the link to my socials. If you'd like to email me about podcast related inquiries, you could do so at Z A K the health King at gmail.com for beat cancer related inquiries. You can email me at Z Frank at beatcancer.org. Our homepage is of course, beatcancer.org. If you'd like explanations or help finding or sorting through any of our resources and free or paid programs, you can email me anytime. Thank you, Zach. I think what you're doing is important, man. Appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you for having me on.